Hi folks, welcome back to another uh, Rust stream. This time it's gonna be uh, probably a longer stream um, and we're gonna tackle more of like an implementation problem as opposed to, you know, the, the crust of Rust style teaching. Um, I, th there are a bunch of these on my channel too, so go look at some of the other ones if you're curious. Unlike many of the previous implementation streams, we're not gonna port anything this time. We're just gonna write a Rust thing from scratch. Um, and in particular, the the, I don't want to say problem we're going to tackle, but the the domain we're going to be working in is how cargo talks to registries. So, you know, the most um, most well known registry is crates.io, but cargo does support alternative registries as well. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about how, you know, when you run cargo publish on the command line, what happens and what's the code path that takes you know the the source you have locally and sends it to crates.io or to another registry um, what happens at that registry and when someone runs you know cargo build and has a dependency on your thing how does it get fetched from the registry and in particular the reason we're going to talk about all this is we're going to implement basically that loop um, and when i say implement it's not so much that we're going to implement like you know, the low level logic of like how to issue the HTTP requests, but rather I want to look at the, um, the data structures that are involved along these steps and the conversion between them. The reason I want to do this is because currently that the definitions of do those data structures um, and the, com the conversion between them lives in a bunch of different crates and a bunch of different, just not even arguably not even crates, just different repositories that don't really interact with each other. So they don't share that logic, they don't share the definitions, and that both means that there's um, a potential for them having mismatches between them, but it also means that they don't get to take advantage of knowledge of how the other parts of the system work. So as an example, um, on crates.io, when a crate is published, there's metadata that Cargo sends along with that publish that includes things like the name of the crate and the, the version of the crate. That's also contained in the file that Cargo uploads. And at the moment, crates.io doesn't actually check that these two are the same. And that could end up with just weird things getting in the index or, um, you know, it doesn't basic sanity checking, but it's just, it would be nice if crates.io could just, you know, do these checks. One of the reasons why it would be nice is imagine that over time, Cargo starts sending more information along with, you know, the cargo publish, then you you kind of want to you may want to backfill for all things that were uploaded before cargo started including that information. And in that case, crates.io basically wants to rerun the cargo logic. But currently that logic is just entirely contained within cargo and it's not in a in a place where crates.io can really get at it and, and rerun it. And so uh, we're, we're gonna take a look at the, the, the components involved and try to see if we can construct one crate that can be used by Cargo, uh, that can be used by crates.io, and ideally that can be used by other registries as well that, that may want to essentially implement uh, an index themselves. Okay, so uh, let's see where we start. Mm, we're gonna start by talking about the cargo side of things. So when you run cargo publish, what happens? Well, really what happens is two things. First, cargo runs cargo package, and then it uploads cargo package to a particular endpoint at uh, crates.io. And we, we can look at this if we look at um, the cargo book, uh, that is the wrong part of the cargo book. We want to look at publishing on crates.io. Uh, and I don't want to look at the user guide. I want to look at registry. Ba, 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 ba. Registry web API publish. So we'll talk about publish in a second. Let's talk about cargo package first because it, it runs first. So when you run cargo package, what happens is effectively cargo just takes your entire source directory and your cargo toml when i say source directory i don't i don't mean src i mean the entirety of the thing that contains your cargo toml and the files next to it um, more concretely it's everything that's in your cargo toml include directive not things that are in your exclude and by default everything next to cargo toml 
Um, accept things that are in your git ignore. The default rules are weird, um, but basically it creates a tarball. So, you know, a compressed archive, a zip um, of all those files and renames that into a dot crate file. So in fact, you can find these on your computer. So if we, uh, you know, check out dot cargo slash uh, registry slash cache, actually no uh, dot cargo uh, registry, source, GitHub, that's the extracted one. So I want cache, GitHub, let's ls that. Okay, so at this path, and we'll talk a little bit about what this means in a second. Um, this is where Cargo will download and the .crate files for any dependencies that you take. So these are hosted on crates.io and they are the result of the Cargo package that was run when Cargo publish was run for the appropriate version. So let's look at some random one of these. Like let's look at the zip uh, 7.0 crate. Okay, so if we run file on this, it's just gonna tell us this is gzip compressed data. Um, and you know, it's a dot crate file, but really is a, it, it is a um, dot tar dot gc file. Uh, and we can look at this. Like if we run uh, tar tzf, uh, of that file. You see, it tells us these are the files that are inside of that archive. Um, and, you know, the, the files here are not terribly surprising. You know, there's the files from source, files from benches, the cargo toml, the git ignore, uh, license and readme. This is a CI file that just isn't excluded and therefore is included. Um, there are two files that are weird here. There's cargo toml.org. Uh, we'll, which we'll talk about in a second. And there's the cargo VCS info. Um, and if we do this, let's see if I actually remember tar commands by hand. It's a little unclear. Uh, X. Ooh. What's the one for printing it to standard out? I think it's just O dash. I think I can just do dash o dash, dash o dash. Great. Um, oh, maybe I don't even need the dash. I can just do this. Sweet. So this prints out just the contents of that file within that archive. Um, and you see the, the stuff that's in here is just the, the SHA-1, the git hash of the commit that, in this case, this is my crate. So the commit that I was in when I ran cargo publish that published this version of zip. Right? This is essentially metadata about the context in which the publish happened. There's no guarantee that like my directory wasn't dirty or that I even pushed this commit anywhere or that this is even accurate, but you know, it's, it's there. Um, and if we look at cargo.toml.orig, um, this is the the cargo.toml that was present when I ran cargo publish for this package version. Um, no, no modifications, hence the, the file name .orig here. It is the original cargo.toml. Um, and that gives us to what is this other file that's cargo.toml but not the original? And th the answer to that is, and you'll see this at the top of any such file, that this file is automatically generated by cargo. Um, it's essentially a normalized cargo.toml that removes the use of a bunch of features that are available to Cargo more broadly, um, in part so that the thing that you publish uh, only uses a much smaller set of features for Cargo, so it's more likely to be compatible with older versions of Cargo for people who want to download it. Um, and it also has some other modifications, like it removes workspaces, um, it makes sure that there are no path dependencies in there, no patch uh, statements. So essentially it's sort of a, a cleaned up version of the Cargo Toml. Um, this might be a thing that we want to stick into the, um, uh, the, this crate that we build that essentially goes from, you know, a, a cargo package directory to a dot crate file. I'm not sure though, whether that's a part we want to include here. We might want to say that, you know, our thing is limited to going from, from a dot crate to, uh, the registry. Okay. Uh, so that's all the stuff that is that happens when you run cargo package. It really just generates this file, which is mo like it modifies the uh, the cargo toml slightly, 
it generates this VCS file, and then it tars it all up and renames it to .crate. And you can you can test this yourself. Like if you're in any given um, even uh, in any given uh, crate directory, or cargo package directory, and you run cargo package, it'll do this for you, and it'll tell you where it placed your .crate file, which is going to be slash uh, target slash package slash name dash version dot crate. Uh, and you can look at it and see what's inside. It, it can be interesting. Uh, sometimes, for example, you might look inside and discover that, oh, there's a bunch of files in here that I've just forgotten to exclude that are only used for CI or something. And you can actually make your crate file much smaller, which is going to make publish faster, and it's going to make users on the other end happy as well. OK, so I said that cargo publish is really equal to cargo package plus some kind of you know, curl, effectively, like something that, that sends it to the actual registry that you're trying to publish to. And this is when we get back to this publish endpoint that registries have to implement. The endpoint is you know, the crates.io slash and then this, or whatever your registry might be. You do a put, you include some tokens that, that say that you're allowed, that essentially authenticates you to crates.io. Um, and you know, it, it stipulates that the server should validate the crate, make it available for download, and add it to the index. And we'll, we'll talk about the index in a second. Now, the body of the data sent by cargo is an integer of the length of the JSON data, metadata of the package as a JSON object, then an integer of the length of the crate file, and then the crate file. So, like, the body of the request is essentially a, a manually encoded multi-part HTTP message um, saying the JSON is this long, then the JSON, the crate file is this long, and then the crate file, uh, all as part of the body. And the crate file is sort of well-defined, right? It is just a, a tarball. Um, this metadata, though, is, you know, a, a, a type. It's a structure. Uh, and in fact, it, it's um, outlined below here what includes. Like, the following is a competent example of the JSON object. Um, and so you'll see there's the name, there's the version, there's an array of direct dependencies um, and various information about those dependencies, features, authors, and a couple of, of other fields that, that are also included. And like if you squint at this, you sort of notice that this is really just the same stuff that's in the cargo toml in the crate file, which makes you wonder, why is it also included here? And this gets to part of the reason I want to make this crate, because much of this is redundant. It, it's totally possible to generate this JSON solely from a crate file. Uh, and that's one of the things that we're going to implement. Um, my guess is it was done this way so that the remote server doesn't have to also, you know, extract the whole crate file and parse cargo toml and all of that stuff. And instead they can just parse this JSON, which has all the info. But the crux of this gets back to the server should validate the crate, right? Because realistically what that means is you can't trust that the JSON matches what's in the crate file. Certainly not for the name of the version. So you have to do at least some some parsing of the cargo toml, at which point maybe you should just do the whole thing. And that's what we're aiming, one of the things that we're making to do, um, do easier here. Um, in fact, I don't think there's anything in here, at least at a first glance, you can't get from the cargo toml. Uh, and then there's information about what the response is. We're, we're not going to care about the response. The, our, our job here is just to be able to take a dot .crate file and produce this JSON. And also to, to have the definition of this JSON. Now, there is a crate that already provides this. I apologize for the brightness. Uh, I'll, I'll save you twice in a row here. Um, so there's a crate called crates.io, or crates-io, I guess, um, which has just the definitions of each of these um, API types. Now, this crate, as far as I can tell, isn't actually used by crates.io. It is used, it is intended for those who want to look like crates.io or want to talk to crates.io. Um, why it's not used by crates.io, I'm not entirely sure. It might be because it has a bunch of other stuff in here, like curl and, and URL, because it, it also implements the talking to part, which obviously crates.io doesn't doesn't need, which is why I want the crate that we built to, to really be standalone. Like it, it's not intended to be, you know, doing network stuff for you. It is just the definitions of the, the data formats and the conversions between them. Um, okay. 
So the thing you're gonna see here in particular is the new crate type, which has all of these fields that we just looked at in the, in the JSON here. So this type is one that we're gonna end up replicating in our crate. Um, we could even re-export this one, all the fields are pub, so there's no reason for us to, to split the ecosystem unnecessarily here. Um, but I'm, I would rather do it the other way around where that crate takes a dependency on our crate um, because I don't want our crate to take a dependency on this crate and then bring in all of this like curl stuff, for example. Like that doesn't, that, that feels like unnecessarily expanding the dependency graph. I'm hoping that our crate will only really take a dependency on 30 and, and, and maybe nothing else. Um, but we'll see, maybe this error, I haven't decided yet. Uh, we'll see how that pans out. Okay, so you're in Cargo Publish, which does a cargo package, which we talked about, and then it runs a, a, a sort of curl put, which is uh, putting this JSON to, to the server. What does the server do in response? Well, that's entirely up to the implementation of the registry. Um, on crates.io, it goes into a database. Um, and in addition to going into a database, it also goes into a git index. So the, the crates.io index um, which is to say the, the thing that Cargo actually talks to to discover which versions exist of which crates is at the moment a uh, Git repository. And you can look at it on GitHub. It's, it's this Git repo repository right here. So whenever you run, you know, Cargo update or something like it and you see, you know, updating, um, what is this, what does it say? Like fetching crates.io or updating the index or something. Like the thing that gives you the progress bar that's annoying to wait for and sometimes takes a really long time. What it's really doing is it's doing a git pull from this git index. And if we look at the commit history, you'll see that there's just endless commits of updating crates. Like this thing, this basically means someone ran, you know, a cargo publish of the pub crawl crate version 0.1.0. And as a result, that caused crates.io to trigger a commit into this repository. And if we look at it, the thing it actually does is it updates a file at a path that looks like this. Um, well, we'll talk a little bit about the syntax of these paths. And the context of this file is it's multiple lines. So each version is one line in this file. So if there were multiple versions, in fact, we can, um, let's go look at a file right now. Instead of looking at pub crawl, let's go look at something like, uh, oh, let's look at zip again. Uh, Z-I. So the syntax here is for most, for any crate whose name is four letters or longer, it is the first directory is the first two letters. Second directory is the second two letters. And then the file name is the full name of the crate. Um, for anything that's three letters, it's three slash and then the name of the crate. So uh, uh, actually, let me go into this one first. Uh, ZI. So you see here there's ZI and then under there there's gonna be a PF and under there we find zip and also zips for some reason. Um, but like you'll also see here if we try to go to slash three, these are all of the crates that have only three letters in them. And this one has subdirectories for the first letter of the crate. So if you go into here, these are all the three letter crates that start with A. Um, for the ones that are two letters, it's just a, a flat directory of all of those crates. And same thing for one, that's just all of the ones that have one and you'll see all the letters are taken. So like this is gonna be the crate called Z. So that then gets us back to, well, what, what, what's actually in these files? Um, so inside of the index files is one line per version and each line is a JSON object. And if you sort of squint at this, you'll say, see that this looks an awful lot like the JSON that you're supposed to send to publish, right? Name version depths, which is that same thing we saw over here, depths. And now, it's not exactly the same because for example, over time, the exact syntax for what cargo sends up to the registry has changed. Some fields have become optional, some fields have been added. So it's not exactly the same, but it's sort of the same. Um, and certainly going from what cargo sent, which is all this stuff, to what's in the index should be fairly straightforward. 
There's one field though that's here, but that's not in the publish, which is, you'll notice here, there's no field called checksum. There's name, there's version, there's dependencies, features, and a bunch of other metadata, but there's no checksum. But in here, there's a field called checksum, which is a hash of the .crate file. Uh, and so going from just the published JSON to this isn't possible without also having the .crate file. Hence, it should be possible for us to build the whole conversion, assuming we have the original .crate file. Um, okay. So this should immediately raise some questions like, okay, what if the format of this changes over time? Uh, do, don't these files get really large? Don't we get a lot of commits in this? And we're not gonna dig too much into that in part because you know, with HTTP-based sparse registries, there's a blog post about this on the, the Rust blog, um, people won't be using the git index all that much anymore. The HTTP index though has roughly the same structure. So it's basically like index.crates.io, um, slash, and then these paths. In fact, we should be able to try this. Um, it's index.crates.io slash this. Yeah, so now we got exactly that same index file, but we didn't have to do any git checkouts. And this is what Cargo is, is transitioning to using. Uh, currently you can opt into it, or I think you can opt into it on, you'll be able to opt into it on 168 stable. Um, the default hasn't changed yet, but it, it will at some point. And so there'll be no more of this like updating index resolving deltas business. Um, the other thing to be aware of with this Git registry is it actually gets uh, squashed every so often. So there are way more than 23,000 versions on crates.io, but it gets squashed whenever the history gets particularly long uh, to avoid keeping that, that um, the sort of resolving delta step so, so, long, so long. But in any case, um, the index is, is primarily responsible for hosting uh, this list of versions and the, uh, the dot .crate files that have checksums that match the entries that are in here. And so when Cargo goes to talk to a registry, what it actually mainly does is, you know, if, if in your Cargo Toml you've declared, I have a dependency on zip, then Cargo will talk to the registry um, either over either by Git cloning it or by sending an HTTP request, look at this path, parse that file, like parse each line of that file, look for, you know, basically construct the list of versions that are available, run the resolver to figure out which version among these should I choose based on the dependency declaration in your cargo.toml, um, and then it's going to download the relevant crate file, and then it's going to, you know, do the build. Now, one thing that's worth noting is that the you might wonder why are the dependency lists in here? Because when I download a dependency, it's cargo toml that tells me what the dependencies are. The advantage of having the dependencies listed in the index is that you can do a full resolve of your dependencies by only talking to the index and not downloading or extracting any crate files, which makes it a lot faster. So for example, here, when Cargo sees, oh, you have a dependency on zip, it looks at the index. Let's say it picks, you know, this version of zip. Um, then it looks at the depths. It sees that, oh, it has a dependency on rand. Let me go fetch the index entry for rand and resolve this version requirement. Uh, and then it keeps doing that until it's resolved your entire dependency tree. And then it goes and fetches all the, the dot .crate files. And then it can do the build at the end. Okay, so that is the, the whole path. Now, these definitions right here are also uh, represented in a crate in the ecosystem called crates index. Now, crates index, sort of similar to crates IO, is not just the data definitions. It's actually, it knows how to talk to the, the crates.io index. In particular, it'll do things like it knows about the cargo home directory uh, and knows how to look there. It knows about how to clone the git index and then do lookups into it. So it has a lot more features than just the definitions. But the thing that we're looking for here is uh, crate. So a crate is a sort of abstract concept. You can, it maps directly to one of the files in the index and it doesn't have any information in of itself, except it has a list of versions, right? Which is that a parsed representation of that um, long list. And every version here, oh, so here the fields aren't public, which is also interesting. Um, but you can see that the, the sort of getters we have, name, version, dependencies, checksum features, links, 
is yanked and download URL are all the things from the index with the exception of download URL, which is um, which you can programmatically generate. If we look at the source here though, oh, it uses a bunch of other things to reduce the size of the struct. And we'll talk about this in a second. Um, but basically this is trying to parse out all the stuff that's in those, um, those index entries. And what we're going to have basically this definition inside of our, uh, of our crate as well. Now, one, one thing that's worth talking about here is the fact that, um, you know, this crate does a lot of this. We'll look at cargo in a second too. It also does a lot of this of having special implementations or special, um, types that it uses for some of these things to avoid the overhead of, for example, allocating a string for every field in every dependency of every version that it parses. Um, so for example, in Cargo, it uses this thing called an intern string. Here it's using small string for, for packing short strings directly into the, the pointer. Um, we might need to have our library, if we want it to be used by Cargo, for example, to, it would have to be generic over the string type. Um, potentially more than one string type, but let's say just one string type for now. Um, we'd have it to have it be generic over the string type so that Cargo could, cho could choose to use its own uh, optimized string types uh, rather than being forced to use string uh, the, the same way that we do. Um, okay, so now that we have a, a general idea of the, the sort of whole cycle or life cycle here from publish to consume, uh, the next thing I want to do is dig in a little bit to the, the code on the cargo side and the code on the crates.io side to see where this stuff lives, to explore the code a little bit before we start writing our own code. But before I do that, um, let's do a quick, like, are there questions about, about the life cycle as I've described it so far about the, the various interactions that we've seen or, or any of the data formats or even just what we're building. Let's do like a, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, isn't JSON not very suited for stream dependency resolution? Like you have to parse the whole JSON before even knowing the dependencies list. In practice, it doesn't really matter because the, um, the entries in the registry are all very short. It, it is true that like you could have a fairly long list of dependencies, but realistically it's only your direct dependencies that are listed here. So like there aren't really projects that have like thousands of direct dependencies. Um, and so these JSON lines just aren't very long. And, you know, if you stream deserialize, the amount of time you would save if you were able to start resolving the next one immediately would be basically none. Uh, and so having a format that's relatively easy to work with is, is you know, probably worthwhile here. Um, will there be redundancies if something like zip has a dependency of RAND, but RAND is also in your TOML? So, so this is generated by Cargo for you. This is part of the, the JSON that it publishes. So if you, in your Cargo TOML, you say, you know, um, uh, let's say you are zip 700, uh, in your Cargo TOML, you say RAND equals 0 0.8. Great. So that is in your Cargo TOML. Cargo then packages that up into a crate file, and then it puts that to the, the crates.io web API. And in doing so, it also includes the JSON, which says there's a dependency on RAND 08. And, and it gets that information from your Cargo TOML. So it's, it's redundant, but it's also the same. Like Cargo will derive one from the other. Uh, and then when, when crates.io receives this and, and creates this index entry, it takes the stuff that's in the the JSON it got from Cargo, and then sticks that into the index again here. Um, why build another crate instead of removing or feature grading curl and such from crates.io or from the crates.io crate? It's a good question. Um, part of it is because I want to experiment with this and it's easier to experiment on a thing that I built myself. Uh, part of it is because I, I want more than just what crates.io gives, right? So I want it to, I want to not just have the publish side, I also want the index side, and I want the dot crate side, and I want the conversions between them. So it's a little bit outside of the scope of the crates dash IO crate, and it's a little bit outside the scope of the crates index crate. Um, this is sort of a thing that holds all the things in between. What I would hope to see actually is that 
the crates index crate and the crates IO crate take a dependency on this crate that we build for the definitions, and then they build you know convenience wrappers for accessing those things um, on top of that. Uh, is there any limit on dependency length? Uh, like A depends on B, depends on C, depends on N. So that's dependency depth. There's no there's no limit on that. Um, I don't think there's a dependency on the, the limit on the dependency length either, as in the number of direct dependencies any given crate can have. Neither of them, I don't think, have limits. It's just in practice, no one has a long list of dependencies. And by long, I mean like thousands. Um, why might hosting the index on GitHub be decided? So the reason why the index is hosted on GitHub was mostly because it's really straightforward, um, right? You just have a git index that you commit to whenever there's a new version. It makes it really easy to go back and look at older versions of the index. You have a record, you have like an audit record of every change to the index. Um, looking at the deltas of the index between two different point in time is pretty easy. Um, so like, and you know, it, it means that checking out the index locally is just a git clone uh, and you can get you know efficient delta updates by doing a git pull um, so it, it it has a lot of attractive properties and i think it it made a lot of sense when crates.io was much smaller i think now it's getting to the point and this is one of the reasons why sparse registries was was sort of developed in the first place was it's getting to the point where the git index is becoming or the index being git is becoming a problem um, and you know the, the more scalable solution here is to, to use an HTTP-based API, which is what Sparse does. Um, if the index is a Git repo that they periodically squash, is there a need or mechanism to clean the local clone? Um, you shouldn't need to. Cargo will do this for you. Uh, Cargo manages its, its own um, clone of the index. And so this gets back to one of the things I, I said I was going to get back to uh, earlier which is this part. Uh, nope. So this path right here, um, this is the sort of canonical path for the git index. The hash here is basically a, a, a hash of the uh, URL of the crates.io index. So it's not gonna change. And if you, if you take, a, if you use an alternate registry that's also a Git registry, they'll end up with a different hash here. So that's how Cargo differentiates them. And you can like, you can inspect this. Um, but that's not the one I want. So cache holds the .crate files. Source holds the extracted versions of every crate file. Um, and then index holds the actual index itself. And you see here, if we run git status, um, or if we run ls files, huh? Uh, am I confused? Oh, index. Right, dot cache. Right, so git c this uh, ls files. Oh, right, this is a bare checkout of the repository. I think if we do log, oh, weird. Oh, it's because, um, okay, so the reason why we can't do this is because it's not a standard checkout. They do some things to try to just fetch the head commit rather than fetch the whole history because otherwise it would take very long. Um, so there are a bunch of caveats to this, but this is effectively a checkout of the the Git repository upstream. Uh, and Cargo manages it and it cleans it. It tries to avoid checking out all the commits, all the history, that sort of stuff. And um, this subdirectory here, dot cache, has the actual entries from the index. Um, so you can see here, you know, zipf zip and if we bat that file if we cat that file you see it's a it's json okay so let's look at some code um, let's start out by looking at cargo so we're, we're gonna end up looking a bunch at the cargo code base here um, but the majority of Cargo's stuff lives in the source directory. 
Uh, and then there's the crates subdirectory, which holds um, sort of utility crates, which includes the crates IO crate. So that is actually one thing that's, that's sort of effectively owned by the cargo team uh, already. And I think it is also what cargo internally uses for interacting with crates.io is just not what crates.io uses in order to define its own API. Um, so realistically, you know, if, if, if the crate we build here ends up actually being useful to these teams, it might end up it, that it ends up being adopted into cargo and then the either crates.io goes away or it wraps the crate that we're, we're about to build. Uh, so this is where uh, the crates.io crate comes from and where these definitions are from. Uh, so, we'll, so we'll end up copying a bunch of the stuff from here. Um, if we go back then to source, so what we're really after here is the logic around publish and where those definitions live. Um, well, the, the definitions live in there, but where the, the code for publish lives. Um, so source bin cargo has the definitions for all the various commands. Uh, so if we look at publish, for example, don't want this symbols thing. I don't want this thing either. Um, you see, this is just the definition of the the publish subcommand of Cargo. You see, it uses clap. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, it's a slightly modified version where they have their their own helpers for a lot of these flags because they're shared among many um, many of the commands. Now, the when you look at the exec, and you'll see this for every one of the subcommands, they have a similar kind of structure. They have a uh, a CLI subcommand that, or a CLI function that defines the command. This is sort of a command builder, um, and then it has exec, which is the the actual entry point for executing that command. And you'll see that it doesn't actually do very much. It mostly just you know arranges arguments and then calls into the ops module and publish. So if we, the ops module lives inside of source cargo ops. And this is where the, the definitions of all of these commands actually live. The reason for this split is uh, sometimes a little weird, but it, it's mainly for reusability. It means that you can call these methods from potentially multiple binaries. So you can have multiple binaries that, that share logic for some of the, the underlying stuff of the CLI command. And it also lets you cleanly separate out the things that have to do with the the command line interface, like the actual argument parsing and stuff versus the stuff that there's actual logic uh, and that might be usable by say other crates uh, or other cargo commands, like the external subcommands where people take a, a library dependency, dependency on cargo. Um, so we saw back in, do, 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 back in here, it calls ops publish. So if we go to source cargo, ops, mod, where does publish come from? Publish comes from registry. So you go back here, stick in registry, and we'll see a publish. So this is the, the definition of publish. This is the code that executes when you run a cargo publish after parsing all the registry or the arguments and stuff. And you'll see it mainly finds the, the, the sort of parses your cargo config and your, your uh, workspace manifest. It looks over the members. It looks for the active members, so the package you're currently in. So if you're in a workspace, it tries to find the, 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 the sub or the crate in that workspace that you're currently in because that's the one it assumes you want to publish. Um, and then it you know, checks which registry you actually wanted to publish to. So in this case, it defaults to crates.io registry, but you can, you can say in, um, in your cargo toml, like publish equals, and then the name of a registry to say, this should be published there rather than to crates.io. Um, and then you see it does, uh, bah, bah, bah. it constructs a registry for that publishing and then it calls package one. So this is where it sort of delegates to cargo package to generate the crate file. And what we can look at package one in a second, what that gives you in result is a tarball, and that is the, the dot crate file that we talked about. Um, and then if it's a dry run, then it just doesn't really do anything else. Like it, if it's a dry run, it's sort of done at that point. Um, but otherwise it constructs, uh, it gets the, the SHA of that, um, of that dot crate file that it just generated, it creates a an operation that it's going to send to the crate zero registry. 
Um, and then transmit here is the thing that actually uploads to crates.io. Uh, so this is the thing that you know ends up sending both the the generate generates the JSON, sends the JSON, and then sends the 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 dot crate file as the payload to the the remote registry endpoint. And then this this bit at the end is the the messages you may have started to see if you run cargo publish, which is the the like waiting for the crate to become available. So this is when you run publish, there's a bunch of logic that has to happen on the crates.io side. And part of that is just like, it has to do a git commit. It has to like send it to the database. It has to, I don't know, store the crate file to, you know, it's backing store like S3 or something. Um, and at the end of all of that, your version is actually in the index and available to other people. And this loop is just trying to make the command not terminate until it's actually available to other people. So that if you're on the phone with someone and you're like, I, I ran Cargo Publish, they're not going to say, I can't use it yet. Like it tell me, telling me that the, the version doesn't exist, this timeout is going to, or this, this loop to check that it's available is going to save you from that. Um, you'll see there's a verified dependencies here, which um, does things like check that you're not trying to publish a crate that has Git dependencies, for example, that's not permitted. Uh, and transmit is this uh, implementation of sending the the payload to to crates.io, um, which you see here it, it computes the list of dependencies. Whoa, computes the list of dependencies, um, generates this new crate dependency type, which which is part of the new crate JSON payload um, that describes each of the dependencies. Um, it parses out the manifest parses out the readme, looks at the license file, uh, and then ultimately constructs one of these new crate things, which has all of that information that it just extracted from the manifest. Um, and then somewhere down to the bottom here, uh, bah, 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 bah. yeah, here's so it calls registry.publish. And this is from the crates-io crate, which has a publish method that uses curl to actually send the payload. So, a bunch of this stuff, like generating these, um, this like intermediate stuff, is are things that we could do in our crate. There's no need for that to be part of Cargo itself because it's a standardized process of going from I have a package to I want the payload. Um, and then on the receiving side for crates.io, um, you'll see there's a, there's a bunch of code here too. It's also written in Rust mostly, except for the front end, of course. Uh, Prime is salty about me not following him on Twitter. Oh, well, too bad. I'm sorry. I, I'm very, it's it's interesting actually for Twitter, um, at least certainly in the early days, I, I was very cautious about who I follow simply because otherwise I can't read my timeline. So I, I tend to actually, or I don't really do this anymore, but I used to actually read every tweet on my timeline, which only scales if you follow a small number of people. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Primogen. Very sad that your raid uh, didn't really work. <laughs> I uh, I only recently set up the the ten minute follow chat block because we kept getting just spammers come in and it was really annoying. Um, but it it does uh it does get get sad if people want to raid. Um, okay, so let's look at the crates IO side of things, like where they receive this JSON payload. Uh, so from memory, this is source controllers crate publish. Um, so this is the thing that handles puts to crates new. Used by Cargo Publish to publish a new crate. Uh, and you'll see it takes uh, the request it splits the body using this fact that it knows the length of the JSON and the length of the, the crate. And so this is the parts of the request that are the JSON and the parts of the request that are the tarball. Uh, and then you see it decodes the JSON bytes using this, this encodable crate upload. No, I don't want that. Encodable crate upload. Okay, fine, I'll use it. Uh, definition over here. So that's defined somewhere else. And you see, this is just the same definition that's in the crates IO crate, just slightly different uh, types for different things. Like for example, you see they have 
Um, they have new types around a bunch of these. I'm not entirely sure why. It might be so that they have um, more type safety, actually, so that they ensure that they don't accidentally pass in, you know, the uh, the the I don't know, name of a dependency instead of the name of the crate, right? So this gives you compile time guarantees that you didn't pass the wrong field in the wrong place. Whether this is something we want to ado adopt in our own crate, we can discuss. I mean, I think it is valuable, and you can always choose to not use it pretty easily. Um, yeah, so that's an interesting... I kind of want to keep this file open as well because we're going to want to refer to that later. But you see it uh, parses out the JSON and then it... Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba, checks for any missing metadata, which is disallowed. You must have a description. You must have a license in order to upload. Connects to the database, constructs a new entry in the database for based on the information that's that's in the JSON metadata. Uh, starts a transaction to actually store all the information in the in the database itself. Checks that you have the rights to publish. Check that uh, the name is actually one that you're allowed to publish to. Checks rate limiting and whatnot. And reads out the tarball, finds the checksum, uploads the S3 thing. Yeah, so this is all like the standard stuff that you would expect S3 to do. And at the end here, you see it registers this crate in our local Git repo. So this is the thing that actually generates the, the Git commit that eventually ends up in the crates.io index. And you see it has basically the same fields that we've already talked about, the name, the version, the checksum, et cetera. But this then is using a different crate again for the definition of what goes in the index. Let's go and see if we can find that. So this is one of the reasons, again, that why I wanted to build this is because all of these, all these crates, all these parts of the ecosystem have different definitions for the same thing. So this is the crate type inside cargo registry index. So cargo registry index is a subcrate of crates.io, and in libs.rs it has a definition of crate, which is the stuff that ends up going in the index. So here's yet another definition of that. The Primogen's crew are, are very sad that they had to wait 10 minutes to, to actually enforce the raid. What you should have done is raid and then not, and no one say anything for 10 minutes. And then all of you chat at once. Because then it would have been, a, it would be a double raid. One is lots of people joined. The second is lots of people started chatting. Um, okay, so now we've we've explored the space of things that all have this this logic these de data definitions um so let's uh let's pause there again and see is everyone following uh, are there questions about the stuff we've discovered so far uh or about the plan going next how's the support for using custom registries other than crates.io i've never seen it used unlike other ecosystems like npm um it, i mean they're they're totally supported the, one of the things that's tricky is you, you're not generally allowed to have cross registry dependencies so you can't publish something that creates .io that is a dependency on something that's in a different registry, I think. Um, it's also a little annoying to implement a registry in part because of this requirement that your index is Git. Um, it's, it, you know, most of the, the companies that provide like registry implementations, they tend to have, you know, some centralized backing infrastructure for how they implement all of their, their registry support, whether that's NPM or PyPy or, or you know, Cargo. But Cargo's registry is Git, which means you would have to like on the fly generate a Git repository based on the stuff that's in your database. And this is very expensive and really cumbersome. Uh, and so I think some of them are, are probably holding out for the sparse registry stuff where it becomes a lot easier to implement your own registry uh, based on the infrastructure you already have in a way that's, you know, scalable and manageable. Uh, <laughs> the Primogen's crew's attention span, span is only four minutes. So therefore they, they couldn't pull off the, the 10 minute delayed raid. Um, yeah, so so there there are a couple of alternate uh, registry implementer implementers. I think um, oh, I forget the name of them now. Um, 
Yeah, so someone mentioned Gitti. There's um, this one starts with A. I want to say Anchor, but it's not Anchor. There, there are a couple of them, but realistically, um, they, they, they all sort of struggle because they're forced into using a Git registry like this. And I mean, Crates.io is as well, so it's not like they're really at a disadvantage. It's just, it's just really cumbersome. Um, the other thing that's that's annoying actually with registries today is there's not great support for um, authentication. Um, there's a very basic setup, but it only really authenticates publishes and not things like reads, uh, which, you know, if you're running a private registry, you want to control who's able to access your registry in the first place because you might be uploading, you know, uh, commercial things to it. So you don't want anyone to be able to clone and Git doesn't have great authentic or Cargo doesn't have great authentication support for, for private registries, which is one of the things that's currently being worked on is, is an authentication mechanism um, for cargo requests that are for reads as, as well as other operations. Um, so that, that's some of the reason too. So there's like a bunch of hairiness here, but a lot of it is being worked on right now. I, I recommend that if you're curious about this stuff, like go join the, the Cargo Zulip and you know, see if you can help out. There's, I think there's a bunch of open issues too for, for things that might help speed this along. Um, some of it is also just like, test this out on your own. Like for sparse registries, for example, having people test it out in their config, see whether things generally work for them is very useful feedback. Um, Artifactory, Muse, Alexandria. Yeah, so there are a couple of, of um, alternate registries that people have implemented. Okay, great. Let's actually write some code now. Uh, cargo new, lib. What are we gonna call this lib? Um, it's sort of like cargo registry. The, one of the reasons I don't want to use cargo registry is because I really want to, probably in a different stream, implement a cargo subcommand called car regi cargo registry. But I don't want to reserve that name here. Um, it is arguably cargo index. Cargo index types. Cargo index. So it's not a, it doesn't let you implement a cargo index, right? That's one of the reasons I don't want to call it just cargo index. It has the types for for interacting with a cargo registry. It has the types that are in the index, cargo registry types. It's not really that either because, you know, a registry also has to support other endpoints like uh, yanking. Um, they also have to, you know, have the HTTP response types encoded. Um, it's not cargo types because there's a bunch of things in cargo, like types for things like a workspace, which this is not going to hold. Um, cargo schema isn't bad, although this isn't the schema for all of cargo because that would include things like manifests, which we're not going to encode. Um, but maybe cargo index schema or registry schema, index schema. I'm torn between index and registry because the index doesn't know anything about the published JSON really, right? That That's an intermediate data format that never makes it into the index. Um, but registry is a little bit too broad. But maybe it really is interface. Maybe it is cargo index interface. It is true that cargo dash is a, a naming convention for cargo subcommands, but at the same time, it is the appropriate name here, right? Because we, it's not crates IO index interface because this applies to any cargo registry. Cargo space, that's funny. <laughs> Uh, I mean, we could also call it interface for 
cargo indexes. But that's an awful name for a crate. Uh, Hmm. If if key. Interface for cargo indexes. Ah. Uh, I I think it has to be cargo index interface. Cargo index schema. Cargo index. <laughs> Freight types, that's funny. Uh, defs. It could be cargo index types, actually. Ah, uh, but it also has the conversions. Naming is hard. Cargi is pretty funny for a cargo index interface. Cargo index stuff. I, I do like cargo index stuff. Handoff is not bad. Let me, Merriam Webster, come help me. Um, I want, I'm sorry, this is bright. I want, um, I want the, the source entry for handoff. Ugh. Um, why does it not have a thesaurus entry for handoff? It's like trans transit. Cargo in index transit. Yeah, cargo index transit. Because it's a transit point. It's all the transits you need in order to interact with the cargo index. Relay is not bad either, but I like transit. So it's gonna, also transit and cargo are somewhat related, so I like it. <laughs> cargo UPS. Um, okay, so what do we have here? Well, let's start out by saying this is gonna depend on Surti. Um, okay, let, let me use the, let's be fancy here. See this part, this part, I'm so excited for this to go away. In fact, can we just, um, here's what I'm going to do. Override set beta. In fact, I thought I already had beta. Uh, and let's do the bill. No. Blog, uh, and I think it's on the intern, the inside Rust blog, uh, new index protocol. Add this. So normally you're supposed to add this to your cargo home cargo config, uh, but instead what I'm going to do is just add it to the local directory config. And the reason for that is it's not unstable yet. So if I added it to my system-wide config, I'd start to get build failures in a bunch of packages because stable doesn't have the feature. Whereas if I add it locally to this, I'll get it for the, the local one. So dot cargo config, I'm gonna have to make there dot cargo first, uh, stick this in here. And now if I do cargo add, it's already feature. Boom, updating crates IO index took no time because it didn't have to do all the Git stuff. Nice. I guess that's one satisfied user report. So let's see what it actually added to my cargo toml. It added the current version with features derived. Beautiful. Okay. Let's go back here. So um, I don't want these. Uh, what I want here is actually to, to split out the different phases, if you will, right? So, so the phases here are, um, there's the sort of dot crate. Uh, there is the publish. Uh, there is the, and then there's the index. And uh, let's go ahead and do this and this and this. 
Uh, and let's start with publish. So inside of publish, we have two primary definitions, right? In fact, we have, yeah, we have two primary definitions. There is the one in crates.io. which is all of this bit. So let's go ahead and tidy this up a little bit. These things we obviously don't have. And this is all going to complain about things. I don't want DREF. Because that's not a thing that we have. Um, we are going to have to take a dependency on Semver, which is the crate that um, has the implement. Ooh, actually, I want features. Thirty for that, um, which is a crate that has the definition of semantic versioning versions, which appear in a bunch of these places. Um, so we have in the index, no, in publish, I mean. What else do we not have? It's another DREF. Dependency kind. Where does dependency come, kind come from? It comes from models. And models, dependency kind, and keyword. So here is a keyword, which I think they used under a different name. They used it as create keyword. Uh, and this is probably a chrono thing, which is, yep, chrono native time. Whether we actually use chrono here remains to be seen. Um, and then what else we got? We wanted the thing from here, dependency kind, which is one of these. Great. All right, what else is missing? Encodable crate version rec. Serialize, serialize, probably also deserialize for all of these because we're gonna have to do both ways. The reason I'm copying all of these in is because I want to have all the source definitions in one file. So I'm going to do the same for the ones that are in uh, Cargo. Oh, interesting. Looks like they have manual deserialized implementations here, maybe. Uh, there's a crate here. So these are helpers for validating that Features have the appropriate name and stuff. We gotta figure out what we do about those. Whether we still, whether we also do validation in here. The reason they do uh, validation on deserialize here is almost certainly because that means that the the type that you end up with, you know that if you have that type, it is all it already conforms with the rules for that string. If you just have a string, you don't know whether it, for example, doesn't have spaces in it. Uh, for a crate name, as an example. Whereas if you, in your deserialize, and I'm guessing they already checked this uh, encodable dependency name, 
uh, valid dependency name probably checks for, among other things, whether there's a space in the name, which is disallowed. Uh, and so it won't even deserialize if it doesn't meet those criteria. Um, So I think we'll we'll probably want to do this too. Um, now, what's interesting here is that Cargo might not want this. So, so one option is for us to be generic over the uh, the types for basically all of the string encodings here, so that you know Cargo can choose to just use like intern string, uh, Crates.io can choose to use their encodable versions, and we don't implement the logic for you know sanity checking that these values are the right way. Uh, un unclear actually, because one thing that's sad, right, is we're going to end up with like name S or name T verse T uh, feature T, right? Um, because each of these are a different type. So it's going to be a lot of generics, which is a little sad. Um, but let's not fix all the compilers here at the moment yet. What? Why is there? Why does it claim there are two implementations of serialize? Oh, there we go. Encodable crate version cannot be dereferenced. That's because this has to be self.0 instead. We go. Um, what about two types, raw crate upload and validated crate upload with a from or into instance? So I want to avoid getting trapped in a position where um, we try to do too much in this crate and therefore no one ends up using it because it does too much. I want this to be a, a sort of foundational crate that the other two can build on top of. Um, and so encoding too much stuff in here, I think is probably the wrong way to go. I would rather go the other way um, of saying this has only the, the core bits and then um, additional stuff can be built on top of it with, with any more additional logic that they might want. Um, okay, so that's the stuff from Crates.io and then we'll want to also pull the stuff from Cargo, which lives in Cargo Crates, Crates.io, LibRS, uh, new crate and new crate dependency. Right, so I guess we can do this and say uh, from crates.io and this is from cargo. And at least in theory, these should be equivalent. That's the hope, right? What's interesting here is like in cargo, for example, a uh, the dependency type is new crate dependency, and the kind of a new crate dependency is just a string. Whereas in crates.io, dependency kind is encoded as an enum of normal build or dev, um, and you know it's it's interesting. We we sort of have to decide whether we want to go the cargo way of saying because we're only constructing this, we're never consuming this, we're just gonna have a totally general type here because we don't, it, it, it's always gonna be controlled by us. So there's no need for additional validation on it. Whereas on the crates.io side, they're consumers of it. So who knows what garbage JSON they're gonna be sent. They don't know that it's gonna come from a real cargo. So they have to verify everything. Um, so where we fall on this is gonna be a little interesting. And you know, the, whether this is an enum or a string is gonna be one example of that kind of choice that we're gonna have to make. Um, okay, so that's all the stuff in publish. Let's also bring in the stuff from index while we're at it. So that in cargo lives in, right, I'll keep that open for now. So the entries in an index in cargo live over in core registry. I want to say it's summary, 
which is inner. So the question is, where is summary new called from? So summary new, you see takes like a package ID, dependencies, features, and links, which is basically the stuff that is already in the index. But that means by the time summary new is called, it has already been parsed. So let's go ahead and look for uh, summary new. See where that might be called. Resolver version prefs. This seems promising. Utilities, Toml mod. Uh, where's this coming from? Process dependencies. This is one long function. What does this parse? To real manifest. That seems different. That seems like um, manifest conversion, which this might even be the thing that takes a cargo toml and turns it into the the cargo toml that ends up in your crate file. So it takes the orig and creates the non-orig. Um, uh, registry index.rs. This seems promising. JSON parse. Registry package. Please be extremely careful with returning errors from this. Okay. So registry package seems like a thing that we care about. A single line in the index representing a single version of a package. Nice. So this seems like the, the definition that we want. So this again is from cargo. And I guess we can grab like these things from over here. Now here you see it uses intern string, which is the, um, the type the cargo uses to essentially deduplicate allocations of strings. So intern string is more or less, um, when you create an intern string, it first basically checks this giant hash map of, has this exact string already been allocated on the heap somewhere? If so, let me return you just a pointer to that instead. It's essentially a globally reference counted string mechanism where the only way you garbage collect is the program terminates. Um, so what's version here? I'm gonna guess it's probably Semver. Yeah, Semver version. So this is Semver version. Um, now intern string, we're gonna have to figure out what we do about, but let's just make those be string for now because they're more or less equivalent. And again, th this indicates that we're gonna have to be generic over these things. Uh, at least for if we want cargo to be able to use these definitions as well, they're going to want to use intern strings and we want to uh, give them that ability. Registry dependency. So where is registry dependency defined? That's down here. That has string as well. Cow is just from the standard library. This we make a string. This we make a string. It's interesting here that that for some of these they are using um, cows, so with a reference to the input, and you know that this gets at another use case that we might want to cater to, which is if you're decoding JSON, then very often you can deserialize um, in such a way that the deserialized copy just references the input text. So you don't actually have to allocate a new string. You can just have a stir reference to the original input instead, which is what these end up being, which saves you from a bunch of allocations. Um, so that might be something we want to capture. And then let's look at from crates.io. What do we get there? Uh, this, oh, someone asking about this. This is like the new GitHub search stuff. Um, which is sometimes nice, but it also, it, it hijacks things like your control F, which makes me really sad. Um, but, but in general, it's, it's a little nice. Like search is much better with this, but I think it's still beta. I want to say it's still beta. All right. So now we want to find where are the definitions in crates.io 
used to serve the index. Uh, so we've seen the code for this already, actually, because it, it was in, uh, in publish, create, publish, right? We saw somewhere down here the add crate in source worker git index add crate job. So just in two value inner. So this is like a job thing. So this is presumably they have a job that regularly does, you know, git commits and whatnot. Um, but I really want to find what handles something over here, perform index add crate. Or is that defined? Let's define over here. The, the definition here is just entirely search based as far as I can tell. Yeah, it says right here too, that it's um, it just searches for, like it knows that this is one word and when you click it, it shows you all the results for searching for that word in isolation. And it tries to guess which ones are definitions and which ones are uses. Because uh, I don't think they have like semantic support for Rust at the moment. Um, okay, so this locks the index, uh, computes which index file to use for the name. So, th so this is the part that that constructs the the like you know slash zi slash pf slash zip. Uh, that's going to be that function. But what does it write out? JSON32 writer crate. Okay, so just serializes this crate type and then it writes a new line at the end. Okay, so what we really want is this crate type which comes from cargo registry index. So it's really just this bit. So this is the stuff that goes in there and dependency is probably defined just below. It's interesting, they have a They've impl implemented ordering for dependencies. I wonder why that's implemented. Oh, interesting. All right, we'll, we'll grab those two. Seems reasonable. This is standard compare ordering. Uh, dependency kind is probably the same dependency kind that we already got from elsewhere? I would hope. Or do they have another definition of dependency kind? Yep, there's a second dependency kind definition right here. Great. And this one's not the same one that's used elsewhere in the Crates.io code base. Fantastic. Okay, so now we have that definition. And I guess this isn't used. Uh, deserializer isn't used, serializer isn't used, and this isn't used because we don't have any manual implementations. All right. Uh, and then I guess the last part is dot .create files. And so here we have to be a little, not careful, but we have to figure out what matters to us because, you know, we could take a dependency on cargo. That's one option here. We take a dependency on cargo and use cargo to, so we extract the .crate file, we use cargo to parse the toml that's inside of it in order to generate the, the published JSON. The downside of doing that is it, it means that cargo can't take a dependency on us because it would be a circular dependency, right? Uh, so using cargo for this is probably not what we want but at the same time, the cargo toml manifest format is entirely defined in cargo. But we only need the definition of the simpler dependency, uh, the simpler cargo toml manifest, which is the one that appears in uh, in the dot crate file. Remember how we have the original, which is like a full fledged cargo toml, and then we have the the generated cargo toml file, which is supposedly a, a simplified version. So the question then becomes, where is that defined? Um, that's gonna be something like, 
Well, we saw the two real manifest. Actually, let's go to, let's go look at the cargo. Uh, let's go look at cargo ops package. Because that has to have a call somewhere that does that rewrite. And I'm wondering whether there's a type definition just for the like the simplified manifest. Build AR list. Oh, so this is the thing that decides what goes in the archive. So it loops over all the source files. And for cargo toml, it pushes into the archive the original manif like under the path original manifest file, which is probably cargo.toml.orig. Uh, the contents of the old one, and the generated file manifest. Generated file manifest. Okay, so somewhere up here we have this. And so we want to know when it prints out file contents of a generated manifest, what does that look like? That's down here. Okay, so this is when we're looping over the things that are supposed to go into the .create file, if it's a th file that's on disk, we just write out the file that's on disk. If it's a generated file and it's a manifest, then use package.toRegistryToml. Okay, what's well, toRegistryToml? It's defined in source cargo core package toRegistryToml. It takes the manifest of the workspace the original manifest and calls prepare for publish. All right, what? And then it calls toml to string pretty. Okay, what does prepare for publish do? Prepare for publish returns a toml manifest. Okay, so toml manifest seems like the type we want here. Uh, the question is, is toml manifest uh, the whole like cargo manifest definition or is it somewhat simplified? If I find Tommel manifest here, oh, it's going to be a giant type, isn't it? Uh, Tommel manifest. Tommel manifest. You can't see what I typed. It's just, uh, it's not very interesting. Oh, no. Yeah, so it's just here in the symbols. I typed Tommel manifest. Uh, and now it won't take me to it. Take me to it. All right, manifest, there we go. This type is used to deserialize cargo toml files. Yeah, that's what I was worried about. So what that means is there isn't a separate type for just the simplified manifest that cargo will write out. Because in that manifest, for example, there is no workspace definition. Hmm. Hum, 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 hum. Prepare for publish. Because this only writes out some of them is the thing. So we could probably come up with the definition here that is only the bits that are actually generated. Like you see here, you know, this, uh, this uh, prepare for publish method produces a toml manifest, but there are a bunch of fields that we know are always none. Like project is always none. Dev dependencies two are always none. Build dependencies two are always none. Replace is none, patch is none, workspace is none. Badges, honestly, we could probably skip because they're effectively deprecated now anyway. Um, cargo features. Mm. Yeah, I'm torn here about what we do because
Like we could copy this whole thing and then strip out the things that we know are going to be none. But like some of these are non-trivial, like Tomal lib target, for example. Oh, it's just type def to be Tomal target. So maybe these aren't too bad. And for things like maybe workspace dependency, for those, for us, are just Tomal dependencies. They're never going to be a workspace dependency. So that might make things easier. Right, if we go back here, uh, self dot dependence, self dot dependencies as reps, but it calls map depths and map depths defined down here will call filter all, what does all do? I'm trying to see whether this actually filters out things that are workspace dependencies. Filter. Maybe workspace defined. Yeah, so the defined type is used when it's not a part of the workspace. So the workspace type is never used. Right, so what this, this map depth thing is doing is removing anything that is a workspace dependency. Those are, those are filtered out. And so that means we don't have to encode those. Okay, so let's try to see if we can just construct a, a simplified version of Toml manifest that only includes the bits that are actually um, that are actually settable from uh, in the, the sort of normalized manifest. Okay, so we're gonna need a couple of other definitions here. We're gonna need Toml package. We're gonna need Toml profiles. Well, actually, we might not need profiles. Um, but we're gonna need Toml, Toml package. Is Toml package always set? Package is set, project is not. Okay, so we need Toml package. Ooh, this feels like it's gonna be painful. Now, there's another option here, which is instead of actually semantically parsing this, just using, just parsing it as like generic Toml, so all we get back is like a giant B tree, um, like it just a, basically like similar to a 30 JSON value, and then we just fish out the things that we want. But it is nice to have it be, you know, structured. Um, there won't be a definition of this in crates.io unless they also parse the, we could check whether they also parse the dot crate file, but I have a feeling they don't really. Uh, so let's see what this verify tarball thing is. Okay, they decode the tar archive. They see that the contents of the archive are reasonable. But they only check the path. It doesn't look like they actually check the, the cargo.toml. I mean, it could be they do it somewhere else. but I don't immediately see anywhere else where they... Actually, we could, of course, search for cargo toml. See what we find. Let's render readme, create sidebar, create publish, line 376. Aha, okay, they do. Okay, so this is add dependencies. 
This is walk all the dependencies and check that those dependencies are available in the registry. So this is different. This is just checking that you're only taking dependencies that are from the registry. Create metadata, what's in here? Encodable crate. This also seems separate. It might actually not look at the cargo toml at all. But it's like the, the check that it does down uh, not here. Where was I just now? Um, the thing that we just looked at that I this one uh, where it checks that the the subdirectory path that the only subdirectory path you have is the name of the crate that you just uploaded in its version basically ensures that that is the crate that's being used because cargo when it downloads the dot crate file that's the only path it will look at so if some other file is there it wouldn't work um, but it never actually parses the cargo toml it looks like which is presumably because they don't want to have to encode all of this stuff in their crate um all right, so what's maybe workspace field? That's maybe workspace. What's maybe workspace? That's a certy untagged that's either defined or not, which means it doesn't matter to us. So anything that says maybe workspace field, we can just replace with the inner type. Um, string or bool, string or vec, yeah, I love those. Vec string or bool. That's fantastic. Uh, right, we are going to need the Tommel crate here. This is going to be uh, cargo index transit, car cargo add toml. Guess not. It's fine. Um, okay, so that's toml package. What else do we have here? Uh, toml, toml lib targets. Let's go back here to see what actually gets set. So package matters, project does not. Um, dev dependencies two does not. Build dependencies two, oops, did I delete the wrong thing? Yes, I did. Whoa, Surdy rename dev dependencies. That's fun. Um, dev dependencies two does not get set. Build dependencies two does not get set. Replace does not get set. Patch and workspace do not get set. Okay. So let's go back here to the manifest definition. That did not work for some reason. Um, so I want the, these type defs. And we're going to need Tommel target. I think we're also going to need Tommel dependency, right? So, uh, maybe workspace dependency, I think is really just the workspace dependency, this one is really just the type definition of toml dependency. So anything that says uh, maybe workspace dependency is really a toml dependency. 
uh, and Tommel dependency is defined over here. And that of course has a has its own special deserialized because of course it does. Um, board phantom data, that seems fine. Detailed Tommel dependency, we're also gonna have to grab. Which is fun. Okay, so we have this. So this is presumably why no one's done this before, is because it's, to some extent, really annoying. Um, and, and also, like, it's unfortunate to have to replicate all of this data. Um, but it is nice to have a sort of simple a representation of what's actually, what actually ever goes into the cargo toml that's in the crate. Um, so that's detailed toml dependency, but we know that for all of the detailed toml dependencies we call map depths which calls map dependency and it maps anything that's detailed and removes path we know there's no path in there it removes git it removes branch, it removes tag and rev. Uh, it changes the registry index, which is fine. It leaves everything else alone. And simple dependencies are turned into detailed dependencies. Okay, so that's interesting. So there are no... Um, there are no simple dependencies. There are only detailed dependencies. Okay, that's nice. So this is actually Tommel dependency. That's nice. There are no intern strings. Uh, maybe workspace field is always just the first thing. Uh, parameter P is never used. Great, so P goes away. Tumble platform we're gonna need. So where does Tumble platform come from? Tumble platform. Okay, so we have Tumble platform, but Tumble platform is also remapped. I think I saw. Where is the platform? Wait, which field even is platform? Target. Because the target here gets mapped to Tommel platform where dev dependencies two and build dependencies two are empty. So if we grab this in here, build dependencies two, dev dependencies two is nothing. Maybe workspace dependency, we already said our Tommel dependencies. Uh, this can just use rename all to get rid of these. Okay, and then the things that remain are these uh, string or vec. Version trim white space, that's fun. Uh, that's that's a pain. Okay, so there's a string or bool, string or vec. Okay, so these are just like sturdy helpers that I guess we'll we'll have to bring in because we don't really have a choice. Um, but we can bring them into a submodule, right? So we can do uh, mod dsir, uh, and we're gonna do this. We're going to go to its definition. Create it for me, please. Thank you. Um, and grab in the Surdy stuff. And I guess use 
standard format and see this should all now compile. It does not. Cannot find maybe workspace field. Well, it's not going to be maybe workspace field. It's just going to be one of these. Ah, and um, version trim white space is not going to have to handle visit map because it's never going to be a Toma workspace field. So it's going to be a string. So it's just going to be parsed. And now it's complaining about, right, that's fine. Okay. We're slowly but surely getting there and cleaning this up. Uh, Tomal profiles is still missing. Tomal target is still missing. Uh, I'm going to go here and do use dsir star. It's going to help a little bit. Uh, Tomal target we still need. Back doesn't work because why would it? Um, Tomal target, of course, is also non-trivial because it has to be. Um, what do we use of Tomal targets? Because they also get mapped somewhere here. 1456. Um, ba, ba, ba. Read me. Where's the target bit? Right. So targets get mapped. That's curious, actually. Where is Tomal target used? Right. This is a different kind of target to this kind of target. Basically, target is a platform, and these are targets as in I want to build this binary, as opposed to target as in target platform because that would be complicated. Uh, so this is not a target. This is one of these, and those are cloned as is, which means all the fields matter. Path value, all right? What's path value? What, so it's just a string? Oh, it holds a path buff, but it's serialized and deserialized as a string. Interesting. Okay, that's that's fine, I guess. Uh, I guess it's not just deserialization either because we just brought in a serializer. Uh, and this is going to be standard path path buff and debug is fine. So now we have path value. These are all, of course, annoying. What's really sad about this, right, is that we're replicating a lot of the definitions without making changes. Like I was hoping that this would be sufficiently trimmed down that we wouldn't have to, um, I was hoping it was sufficient, we could trim it down sufficiently that the fact that there was some overlap didn't matter because the subset that we're going to use is so small. So I'm, I'm hesitant to continue down this path because, I mean, I guess we're almost done, but I don't know if I want to keep all these types in here. Um, Arguably, what we should do is look at how many of these things actually make it into the, um, the published definition, for example. Because, for instance, this doesn't have any information about things like targets. So we don't actually care about extracting that from the Tomo manifest. It doesn't have anything about profiles. 
Um, neither does the stuff in the index, I think, if we look at it. It has name, version, dependencies, checksum, features, features two, yanked, links, and V. So I think actually before we continue, we're going to prune out all the things that don't go in the upload, which includes all of the targets and the profile. Uh, cargo features, I'm unsure. And the fact that the targets went away means that this goes away. And that Toml platform goes away. Toml dependency is still there, but we pruned that one down a little bit already. Toml package we still need because that defines the um, that defines the actual cargo package, like the name and the version. Oh, it's private. What do you mean it's private? Did I not? Oh, this has to be. What I really want is pub super. Because I don't actually want these to be. Oh, this does need to be pub because it's a type, which I guess means path value also needs to be pub. Uh, although is path value even here anymore? It is not. So we can get rid of that. That makes me happy. And in fact, even within Toml package, right? If we look again at what goes to publish, edition isn't here. Uh, authors is Build is not, at least at the moment, right? It's neither in crate nor is it in V. So well, actually, let's just look at the ones that are actually complicated. Badges is the main one. So build is not there, so it can go away. Meta build. What on earth is meta build? Meta build. Do I even want to know what meta build is? Like if I look at a manifest. Meta build. There's no meta build field. See all references. Package. What is meta build? Where does this come from? Meta build. This is very strange. I don't think we're going to need meta build, whatever it is. Um, what else goes in there? Publish does not go in there. And it's not in the index. Which means that we don't need to keep it. Uh, the auto stuff does not go in there. I'm a teapot does not go in there. Workspace does not go in there. Um, Exclude and include probably don't go in there either. Read me, I think does go in publish. Yeah, read me file. So that one we do need to keep. Uh, metadata. It doesn't look like metadata is actually published, which is a little interesting. Does metadata end up in the index? I doubt it because it's like free form. Okay, so in that case, we don't even have to 
parse metadata. This also means that we no longer have a bunch of these. Uh, we have stringer vec from artifact, which it's a good question. Does that end up anywhere? So if we look at the index entries and we look at what goes in dependencies, it has target, it has kind, it has package, but it does not have artifact. That doesn't go in the index. Does that go in publish? It does not, it only has target. Although it's unclear what so all of these things are, of course, named different things. So here, when it says target, what is that supposed to be? I guess it's the platform name. It's probably target here. Okay, so in that case, artifact isn't even a thing that we parse out. Neither is lib. Because remember, this is only the stuff that... Um, the stuff that goes in the index, so the stuff that the registry cares about, are only things that are related to ownership, um, display of metadata, and the resolver, which is ultimately what goes in the index. And so things like this produces a C dilib is not important to the resolver or to the registry. And that's why they're not in here. So even though they are in the cargo tunnel, we don't care about them. Uh, which means that because it's not in the index or the registry, lib isn't necessary. Uh, public. Public doesn't appear to go anywhere here. So public, so public, I think, so this field is probably something that is going to start to be relevant to the resolver because it, it's basically a, a flag that marks whether a given dependency is expo is, um, uh, is allowed to be used in any publicly facing types. So actually, no, it's not relevant to the resolver. The thing this is going to try to help with, um, let me see if I can dig up actually the cargo private dependencies. Uh, not pre-built dependencies. Okay, let's see if Google can search better. Public-private dependencies. This is the RFC I was after. I'll put it in, in chat too. Um, so this RFC is, is proposing the ability to say that I have a dependency and I don't want it to leak. I don't want this dependency to be uh, exposed to my, my consumers. And the reason this matters is for backwards compatibility. Imagine that you take a dependency on foo 0.1 and in your API, you, for example, return a, a type from foo. That means that if you upgrade to Vue 0.2, that's a breaking change for your crate because the it means the type signature of one of your return values changed from Vue 0.1 bar to Vue 0.2 bar. Those are different types. Uh, and so being able to mark your dependency as private is gonna tell Cargo uh, when you build, if you discover that this dependency is visible to it through any of my APIs, then fail to build. Um, but at the moment, at least, that's it's not supported. And also, it's not going to affect resolution as far as I'm aware. So it can go away. Um, great stuff. And I think uh, default features 2, we also know isn't used. If we go back to the part that maps dependencies back here somewhere. Uh, we know that in Toml dependency, in map dependency, no, in map dependencies, map depths, and over here, not Toml platform, config. Oh, it. Dependencies read self dot dependencies. Oh, 
Oh, this is default features. So map depths calls map dependency. I'm surprised actually that this doesn't rewrite the features. That feels like a, a missing feature in Cargo. So, so to give a little bit of context here, the reason you see all of these default, you know, name of field and name of field two is because in older versions of Cargo, the default features field was encoded as default underscore features for unintentional reasons, which means that there are some index files, there are some uh, manifests that have default underscore features for a dependency, or at least it was accepted in the past, which means that we have to continue to accept it. Um, and so the, the thing that might be in a, uh, oh, actually this makes me think that we might have to support it elsewhere. Anyway, the, the, it means that we end up parsing out two fields, one by the name of default dash features and one by the name of default underscore features. Um, and then we as essentially have to you know, combine them or I think what it actually does is read the one with a dash uh, and if it doesn't exist, look for the one with an underscore. Um, now, where this gets a little dangerous is, is it could be that this gets past the dot .crate file that is from eons ago, and so it has the old syntax. It actually uh, has has the underscore, uh, and I do think we might have to handle that. So even though Cargo, when it generates its sort of normalized um, normalized output, you see it never generates a two. It all, always generates the the one, the 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 one with the dash, and not the one with the underscore. Old versions of Cargo didn't have that normalization, so they might still generate one with an underscore, which means our library might receive ones with an underscore, which means we have to support them. So that is all just to say uh, the places where we see a... Uh, let's see, where is the Tomo manifest definition? We actually do need to handle build dependencies two and dev dependencies two. Uh, and we can go back and do this replacement more. So that's fine. So now suddenly our Tomo manifest is much more manageable because it only has the bits that we actually care about. And I'm going to go ahead and make the claim that we should remove badges. Um, badges has been deprecated by crates.io. It was generally considered a bad idea. So I'm going to just going to say we're always going to generate an empty badges list. And if someone wants to get mad at me, they can. Um, and so for publish, I guess we'll still send badges. So it'll just be empty. All right. So I think now our, our dot .crate toml manifest parser is complete. I think there's still some of these that we don't use that we can trim. Like for example, this stuff, the, the stuff that goes to the, to publish, None of that talks about default target or force target for the package. I'm guessing index doesn't either because it. this is more about um, builds than it is about resolution. So these can all go away. Um, exclude and include can go away because they're only used by cargo package. So once cargo package is run, there's no need for exclude and include anymore. Default run uh, also isn't relevant to the registry. So that's gonna go away. Uh, all this metadata though, I think probably is. So we'll keep that for now. And now the question is, what do we parse out? We still have string or bool for the readme, but that's all we have. So, we go back up here. We don't need stringer vec. Or I guess we can just do this and see if anything fails. 
which nothing does. Great. Uh, string or bool we do have. Vex string or bool we do not. And version trim white space we do still use. We don't have any manual implementations anymore. We don't have path buff anymore. So this file is now much simpler. Okay, we're almost there with getting all the types in. Uh, Chrono is no longer here. This is no longer used. So I realize there's one more source we have for index definitions, which is the crates-index crate which we looked at earlier, which is uh, this crate. So this crate, if we go look at its, uh, it's gonna be bright, I apologize. Uh, if we look at its dependence, it's used by like cargo edit, cargo deny, cargo release. It's used by anything that wants to parse stuff that's in the index. Cargo vet, cargo public API, you know, a bunch of these things. But crucially, it's not used by crates.io or by cargo. But it is used, so this is another instance of version that we're going to have to deal with. And we looked at this a little bit earlier. Its definition is over here. And hopefully, right, so they, they have their own string type that they use. Uh, they have a, this is going to be a VEC of dependency, you know, and they have other optimizations where they choose to... Um, use an arc for the feature so that it's so that this is cheap to clone for example we're gonna have to grab dependency out of here which comes down here uh, this again is string string box box string double indirection to remove size from the struct since the features are rarely set Right, so this is a vec string. It seems like for this crate, they've done a lot of work to try to ensure that the encodings or the, the in-memory representation of a single version of a crate or as small as possible, which does make a decent amount of sense because the crates index crate is used often to process crates um, in batch, right? So this means you're doing like, imagine you want to walk every version of every crate. Well, there are a lot of versions, so you really want all of them to be very compact. And so you do what you can to like squeeze these as small as possible. That doesn't really matter for cargo because it's only going to look at a number of versions equal to the size of your, your dependency resolution, which is decently small. Um, uh, and for crates.io, it's only looking at the one thing it's currently publishing, so it doesn't need to be small. But here it does need to be small. Oh, there's another one. Oh, great. Docs.rs also parses it. Of course it does. Um, okay, so they have their own encoding of dependency kind as well. Because, of course... Uh, Dependency kind is defined multiple times. Dependency is defined multiple times. That's all that makes sense. So we're actually going to do uh, mod crates index. Uh, this is mod crates IO. And this is mod cargo. And we'll stick these in there and then string. Uh, this is going to be B tree map. Ah, so there's a dependency here on the hex crate, which I think we do also want. Exists but is in a 
accessible. All right, we'll, we'll see where that comes from at some point. So publish now, we'll do the same. We'll say this is creates IO. This is cargo. And then in dot crate, it's all cargo. Okay. Whew. See, we're on cargo check. We're going to get a bunch of warnings. We're also going to be some errors, I think, in the... Right, so this is over in the published stuff from Crates.io because it has all of these... Um, oh. Um, because it has all of these custom implementations of deserialize that do, you know, validation, um, which includes things like using the... Their, their various validator methods. I think realistically, we're gonna get rid of these uh, and we're gonna replace this with the ability to choose your own type for each of these. And again, like cargo is gonna want this for things like intern string. Um, I, I could imagine that the, uh, the crates index crate is gonna use small string here and uh, crates.io can use its encodable crate names. Um, okay. So someone said there's one more implementation of parsing metadata. So that's going to be tub not that rustlang docs.rs blob master source utils cargo meta.rs. Um, so what does this do? This is different. Uh, so the reason this is different is because this runs the cargo metadata command, which has its own format for output. Um, but we're gonna ignore that for now because that's, uh, I think what cargo metadata outputs is somewhat related to the toml manifest, but they're not the same. Um, so we're gonna ignore cargo metadata for now. Now, there is also a cargo metadata crate, which I think, this one could use, but doesn't. Um, and the cargo metadata crate has the parsing for uh, all of the output from the cargo metadata command. So we look here at um, metadata. It has a package. Package has a lot of the fields that we might be familiar with by now. And you could imagine that we we implemented a um, a conversion between probably be the dot crate stuff and one of these, um, but this has a bunch like this includes things like default run things that don't matter to the registry. This is essentially a print of the Toml manifest, um, but in a slightly normalized way. Uh, so that was a little different. And we're going to mostly ignore it for now. Whew. Okay, so the next step now is going to be to tidy up these so that we... Uh, why don't we need to parse the license? We do need the license. That's in publish. And it's in um, dot .crate. At least I don't think I removed it. It's under package. So that's toml package. Toml package license and license file. So they're, they're in there. They're not in the index. The index doesn't care about licenses. But they are in the published stuff. Uh, okay, so next up now is going to be to tidy up this de these definitions so that we only have one definition rather than multiple. I realize now that I actually should have not been this dumb and should have kept the information about which of the string types these different libraries actually care about optimizing. Because when we were copying out these definitions, you know, some of them like name was in turn string, but some of them like homepage was not, they were always string. And I should have uh, kept that information here and just done like uh, in turn string is string. 
So let me do that real quick because that's going to be nice for us in a second, which is features. I guess let's walk this from the top. Cargo features is a vec of string. Um, string, 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 string. Features is intern string to a vec of intern string. this new search so much. I don't want it to go somewhere. I just want it to highlight. Oh, well. Um, Tomo profile we don't have. Maybe workspace. Tomo workspace dependency. Tomo package. So the name in a Tomo package is an intern string. Addition is not, in fact, that's the only intern string there. Inheritable fields we don't care about because we don't have workspaces. Toml dependency, detailed Toml dependency. Interestingly enough, it doesn't have intern string for the version. Kind of interesting. Ah, but the the oh the map doesn't either. Yeah, it's a, it seems very arbitrary which ones are actually intern string here. Um, but so there weren't too many. Great, so we did those. Um, and for publish, I don't think it actually used intern string there. But let's go look. New crate uses string for everything. There's no intern string here. Okay. Uh, on the crates IO side, uh, we already kept the special types there, so that's easy. Um, and then for index, for cargo, I think we ended up doing some erasure here. So in particular, registry package, the name is intern string. So this is gonna help inform us which of these need to be generic in the future, basically. Intern string, features is an in, ooh, intern string. Um, features two is an intern string. Links. Is an intern string. And for a registry dependency, the name is an intern string. Features is an intern string. And package is an intern string. Uh, the crates.io one, what did crates.io have for here? It just used string for all of these because it only writes it once, so it doesn't really care to optimize it too much. Uh, probably same here for crate and dependency. Those are just strings, great. And crates, registry index, that's the same. And over here uh, in crates.io, we're gonna do a type smolster is just gonna be equal to string. And we have in dependency, name is smolster, rec is smolster, features is box box string, that's fine. This is, <laughs> package is, wait, did I, am I looking at the right, wrong one? I am looking at the wrong one, okay. I'm looking at the wrong one. It should be this one. Type smallster string. This is smallster. 
um, looking at dependencies. This is smallster, this is smallster, this is box box string, this is option smallster, this is option smallster. I, I guess we can keep the box too to make it clear what how they are encoding these. Uh, box box. Smallster, and what do we got for the entry itself? That's up here. They have smallster, smallster. This is for them an arc. We're, we're probably gonna clean these up. I'm just uh, trying to make it so that we start with the right um, type definitions so that we can then optimize them later on. Okay. This is a box hash map of strings. This is an option box of smallster. That's interesting. It doesn't, that seems false. Claims that there's no implementation of serialize for arc of dependencies. I find that hard to believe. Deserialize is not implemented for arc, hash map, string, vec string. But it's using it right here. And this is just derive serialize, deserialize. So I call shenanigans. Let's look at the repository and see. So what's the cargo toml here? Oh, features equals RC is apparently a thing we need. Great. Okay. Great. Uh, and then I guess, you know, what we can do for publish here is instead of having all of these custom deserializes that do validation, we just delete those and retain the types. Um, so we do delete, 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 delete. And then we say type this equals string. I can't type spaces apparently. This is a string. Uh, this is one of these. All right, let's do a macro here. should have included an arrow down at the end of my macro, but I do love macros. Beautiful. Okay, so now, does it now build? It does. Lots of warnings, but that's fine. We don't worry about these. Uh, I guess we can get rid of some of these things now that we got rid of the custom implementations. Multiple fields are never used. That's fine. Whew. Okay. So we're now in a position where we have all of the type, all of the different type definitions from the different crates that are using this. And the next step is going to be to create the definitions that we want to use and the conversions between them. Um, and, you know, probably as part of that, we want, you know, testing, we want documentation and all that biz. 
So that's going to be next steps. But first, I'm going to have a bio break. I'll be back in a few seconds. All right, I'm back. <laughs> I uh, walked out of my office and immediately saw both cats sitting there cleaning their asses. Beautiful. Uh, okay, let's see. Where do we want to start? Do we want to start at the dot crate end or the publish or the index end? You can chat can decide while I eat something. I gotta vote for the crate end, so we'll start there. Mm. Part of the future difficulty, if this common crate gets used upstream, seems like it might hinder future optimizations if they find it's needed. I guess it can be a major similar bump for adding a new field or a list of fields with a generic string type. It's a good point. I mean, there's an argument for we make every type here generic. I don't love that idea, um, but it is a path we could take, right? We could have a one generic for every field. And the only thing that we require is that they, um, I mean, we don't even re really need to require anything. Um, but we want to indicate the type of the field. Why do we want our own type? Shouldn't a generic hash map do? So the reason why these different crates have different definitions here for even things like the map or, or vectors, right? So the, the crates index crate, for example, uses box slice. Um, some, one uses hash map, one uses B-tree map. It's usually because they have different needs. So I think Cargo, for example, tries to keep the entries ordered for anything it sticks in the registry. Um, or actually, I think Cargo doesn't. So Cargo uses a hash map for what it pu for the published JSON, but Crates.io uses a B tree map for the receiving end because they want to make sure that the Crates index entries are sorted so that if they regenerate it, they get the same order of fields to avoid churn in the git diffs. Um, so Cargo wants the, the faster hash map, uh, whereas the Crates.io team wants stable index entries and the crates index crate wants whatever is the most compact representation, which is like a box hash map. 
um, because a hash map has a bunch of fields. So a, indirecting it through a box means it's slower to access, but the, the type is smaller. And so they're optimizing for different things. Mm. Now, dot crate should be the easiest because it's only used by cargo at the moment. Mm. I did find it interesting that cargo only uses intern string for the features and for the name of the package. Not the names of dependencies, but for the name of the package. I wonder if there's some rationale for that. Like if we go back to, um, this is the Tommel stuff, right? So if I go to blame here and I say name colon, and I also do this, so what do we get here? Sorty deserialized for cow stir allocates by default. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because my instinct here is that for many of these, we might actually want a, a cow but that doesn't work for option. But it does work for option though. At least I think it does in newer versions of, of Surti. If so, we should check that because it, um, if that's the only reason, then I'm also curious, like why name? Why just name? Um, what, what was the other one? Features. What? <laughs> Something got very confused here about. Okay, this the the search is very confused about how things work right now. Interesting. So here they're not. So it, it was that previous commit. So it's this. but this is a giant implementation. I remember this PR, like this is huge. Uh, but it doesn't really explain why the change to intern string happened and only happened for features. The reason I'm trying to figure that out is because I'm trying to figure out both, does it matter? Should we use it in more places? Um, Mm. You know, it's tempting to just say, this. Oh. Which I think is supposed to just work. But maybe I'm misremembering. Um... This is certainly my, my instinct is to do this, right?
the box here is interesting. I guess they don't want to inline the Tomo package because it's too large. And then we put Sorority Borrow and like all of them. I'm gonna do the same here. So this takes tick A. And we borrow every single one of them. Or we allow every, every one of them to borrow. And same for Tomal package. So at least in theory, the benefit of this, right, is that if you have a manifest file, um, you're not gonna allocate any strings. because all of them are gonna be just references to the strings in the input. Now, one thing that's inconvenient with a definition like this, apart from the fact that it has a lifetime, is uh, sometimes you actually want an owned copy. Like you deserialize something out of a, you know, some buffer that's temporary, and now you wanna copy it around. So. Um, so what you want is you want, like you, you have a thing that's, ca that's, uh, you know, Tomo manifest tick a, and you, what you actually want is a, um, Tomo manifest that's, that's static that you can like send to another thread or something. So the way that I usually end up doing this when I have, uh, methods like this, um, is, and I guess let's call this normalized manifest is I have a impl normalized manifest uh, pubfn uh, to owned takes a self and returns a so it takes a normalized manifest of any lifetime and it gives you a normalized manifest of a static lifetime and the way that it does that is normalized manifest. Uh, cargo features into iter map. Um, this is cow to owned collect. So for each field, you just sort of figure out how do I turn this into a thing that's static and you do that for every field. So now if someone does want to make that conversion, they have a, a convenient way to do so. This can just be a package. It'll just be dependency and package. It doesn't need to be any fancier than that. Like so. This is going to be package um, to owned. The reason I use the name to owned here is because it's the same thing you have on cows. Is cargo features, oh, it's an option vec. So it's dot map. So. C 
we have here's a vec. So the map, the map here is given a calster and cal two owned, oh, into owned. Yes, into owned is what I mean. And then of course, you know, the you can also do two owned. So it's a reference to self gives you back an owned version of it by doing self.clone.intoowned. Um, you can write a more efficient implementation of it, but for now we're just gonna have intoowned. A value of type vec borrow caster cannot be built from an iterator of elements of type string. Uh, yes it can by mapping this to cow owned. So the setup here is, you know, we map, this is an option, so we map over it. So if it's none, it stays none. If it's some, then we iterate over it. And this is a vector of potentially borrowed strings. We turn it into owned strings with cow into owned. And then we map it back into a cow, which is now gonna be of any lifetime because it's, it's owned. And then we collect it back into a vector, which gets stuck into the option. Um, this we haven't implemented yet. That's why we get that error. Uh, dependencies is going to be a B tree map. So that's going to be something along the lines of self.dependencies.map uh, D into iter.collect. We're going to have to fill in the bits in the middle here. It's going to be a map from of key value. And it's gonna, we're gonna map it to cow owned of k dot into owned. And whatever the value is, which is gonna be v dot into owned, which we haven't written yet. So that's for uh, dependency. Right, so I guess we can write that the signature here. All right, so we're gonna have dependency. We haven't written this yet. And we'll have the same for package. Just to get rid of some of the errors that we're gonna see further up. Right, so this is gonna be this and then map box new. And instead of trying to be all functional and fancy here, we can just do star p. Like so. And dev dependencies is gonna look exactly like this business, except it's gonna be dev dependencies. And dev dependencies two is gonna look exactly like this. Um, build dependencies is gonna look exactly like this. And then features, it's probably structured exactly the same, except the inside is a vec of cows. So we're gonna have to do a little bit more, but more or less it's the same. So f into iter, except that the value here is gonna be into iter collect and it's gonna have the same structure as this one. Where we map it to the own version of the string, map it back into a cow and then collect. Oh joy, what a re method to write. Very repetitive. Um, but so now we have a, we have a mechanism where you know, we're, we deserialize into a fairly compact representation. It's not intern string, right? So there is still the argument that if, if Cargo wants to use intern string, they don't have the option the way we currently structured it. But it looked like the argument for making these intern strings in the first place was that we're, they're currently allocating on deserialize. But this should not allocate on deserialize because 
because we're using 30 borrow. So that should be fine. Mm. Mm, I guess we need to write this. So version here is a little interesting to me because here it's represented as a string, but we know it, that it is a um, semver version requirement. So I actually think that this isn't that, it is a semver version rec. The weird thing about doing it this way is that Similar version recs are internally a vector of comparators, which means that this is going to allocate on every um, on every deserialize, which might be sad. But they already have a bunch of other strings in here, so I, uh, I think I'm not too concerned. I kind of just want to keep it this the way it is. Um. So that means this is going to be self dot. Here's another question. Is version here ever none? For a dependency. I don't think it can be. So remember, we looked at the, the dependencies that get generated here. And for mapping the dependency list, Simples get mapped to sum. I guess there's no, there's technically no check here that version isn't set. But if you tried to declare a dependency on something where the version isn't set, then it wouldn't have gotten published in the first place. So while the well, one of the one of the things that we're running into here is the fact that the cargo definition for Toml manifest is used for a bunch of different things, including just parsing the raw Toml that the user has written. But the Toml that the user has written can have all sorts of errors in it, like not specifying the version for a dependency. So we need to be able to parse it and then realize that is the case and give an error. But for anything that actually ends up in a published dot .crate, it should never be empty. So I think we're going to do this. Uh, and it, this is probably the case for other things too. Not for all of them, right? So for features, for example, it's totally valid to not specify features for a dependency. Does it force them to be some? No, it just clones it at is. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, great. So now we can write this. So version is going to be self dot version dot clone. Many of these, which are just really strings, is self dot register. Uh, doesn't have to clone even. Registry map cow into owned, cow owned. Index is going to be the same. Features is going to look like the one we had up here, this business. Optional is just self.optional. That's already static. Uh, default features is going to be self default features. Uh, this is going to be the same except two. Package is going to be like this. This is an option cow stir. And target is going to be the same. Great. And then for package, we're going to have to do the same kind of thing here. So most of these are just option cowsters. So for a lot of them, in fact, in fact, here's what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to say that for all of these, uh, 15 sub uh, good old regular expressions. We're going to substitute that with um, map cow into owned, map cow owned, comma. And for some of them, that's not going to be right, right? So for this, for example, it's going to be it's just going to be this. Right, did I miss up a thing? Yeah, there we go. Uh, authors is a vector, so it needs the, the slightly more advanced treatment up here, which is this thing. Um, what else do we have? Readme is stringer bool. Keywords, so keywords is like authors. Categories is like keywords. And the string or bool thing we're gonna have to figure out. Cause that should really be like, Cowster or bull, like really. Um, uh, version is a self dot version. Doesn't need any mapping. And then I guess this is just going to be self dot readme for now. Okay. I don't even know if cargo features makes it in here. So the cargo features here, they're not features the way you normally think of features. They're cargo fe they're ca features of cargo that you enable for a particular cargo toml. Like for example, you can say things like, oh, I want to use like resolver version two. Um, and I don't think that ends up anywhere. This has the schema for the index, but it doesn't have the cargo features. So this means that in dot grade, cargo features can go away. Um, package does need to stay. Although I'm still not convinced we actually need the boxing anymore because package is a lot smaller now. Um, but it is an option. So like, although actually, I don't think it is an option uh, because we're not going to have work, workspaces here. So this is never going to be an option. Um, it's not going to be an option because in the cargo.toml that goes in a published crate, there is only one package. There's only there's no workspace. There's a single package, which means we know there's a package there. So it's no longer an option, uh, which means this goes away, and this is just self dot package uh, dot into owned. Great. I really want to get rid of the dev dependencies to stuff. The tricky part here is that I guess we could deal with it in a custom implementation of deserialize actually. Cause from memory, you know, if we go back here, it really just treats build dependencies and build dependencies twos as the same. 
And so we could do the same here and say, rather than have two fields, have a, um, just have a custom deserialization here. Now, the other way to do this, and I wonder if this would come back to bite us. I'm gonna go ahead and claim that it won't and do this. So certi alias is a way to say, um, oh, that also caught a bug. That's supposed to be build dependencies. Um, did I, didn't I copy that from cargo? I think I copied that from cargo. Apparently not, okay, my bad. Um, so this is telling certi that this can also be deserialized under this name, which I think is what we want here. And there's always only gonna be one or the other. What, I guess the thing to check here is, this is gonna be bright, I think, sorry, um, is uh, do, 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 field attributes. Deserialize this field from the given name or from its Rust name. May be repeated to specify multiple possible names for the same field. And it's only for deserialize. So I think that's the behavior we want here, rather than having all of these, these twos. Uh, so that gets rid of this and this. And we can do the same over here, which is alias to that. And that way we don't need to deal with default features two here. I think that's the only two. Uh, in dot create files. Uh, a cargo.toml manifest from a dot create file. From or for a dot create file. So this is now looking pretty reasonable, right? Like the things that go in there ultimately are the definitions of the package, the list of dependencies, list of dev dependencies, list of build dependencies, and the features. And for the definition of a pack, uh, the definition of a dependency, it is the version, it is the registry and the URL of the registry. I don't believe that. The URL of the registry field is an internal implementation detail. When Cargo creates a package, it replaces registry with registry index, so the manifest correct contain, contains the correct URL. So uh, that raises the question of when this writes out the registry, what does it write? Uh, Because I definitely saw something about this changing the entry for the registry, but maybe I'm lying. Package, package, package. Package.workspace equals none. Package project. Something here is a lie. I'm pretty sure we saw something that rewrote the registry name to a registry index in here. Aha, map dependency. Yeah, registry specifications are elaborated to, uh, to the index URL. So it removes the registry and sets registry index. So that means this field is not there or it's not relevant. Um, the registry index is. And the reason for this is because, um, and the, the comment that I just removed said this too, that um, registry names are entirely user-defined. So you and I can both have 
the same registry URL configured as different names on our machines. So the name is sort of irrelevant. When you publish, all that matters is the canonical URL for the dependency or for the registry of the dependency. Um, so registry index makes a lot of sense. Features, which are the features we enable of that dependency. Optional is whether it's optional. Default features is whether or not we enable default features. Uh, package. Package is for whether we rename this dependency when we bring it in. And I have a feeling that also gets removed. Actually, that's a good question. If I go to index, does it have package? I feel like it probably does not because it would be kind of weird if it did. Uh, depths is dependency. Oh, it does have package. Interesting. I'm surprised that it's even necessary for the renames to be known to the resolver. So when I say renames here, it's the fact that you can do something like uh, nom5 equals version equals version equals five package equals nom. And what this means is it's going to look for nom. The, the crate name is going to be nom and it's going to look for version five, but internally in your, in your crate, you can refer to it as nom five rather than nom. Um, and this is part of the reason you want to do this is so that you can do this kind of thing. And now inside of my package, I can do things like use nom seven, colon colon foo. Um, oh, hey, spam. Um, so, so that's the kind of thing that it's trying to do with, uh, spam, 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 spam. Um, so that's what it's trying to record with this extra field. But I'm curious why this is even, why the resolver, why the index needs to know this, because the index should only care about the package name. Because that's the actual dependency that it's taken. Maybe it's because otherwise it would be annoying to deal with uniqueness. Um, but that means package does stay in there. Uh, and target, why does target go in there? Uh, target is in there because you can have target specific dependencies. So in your cargo toml, you can say something like target dot x86 64 unknown Linux GNU dot dependencies uh, nom equals seven. Uh, and what this will do is only bring in the nom dependency if you are building for this target. And so that needs to be known to the resolver because it it needs to resolve your dependency closure and download your crate files and stuff, depending on your current target. Um, and so it needs to know the fact that it's a target dependent, uh, target dependent dependency. Um, all right. So I think everything that's left, oh, right. And for package, uh, the addition, I don't think goes in here because it shouldn't have to, um, and it doesn't go and publish. So addition, we're gonna move away. The Rust version doesn't currently, but is going to. And so I'm gonna leave that in for now. Um, name of the package obviously goes in there. Version obviously goes in there. Authors does go in there and should be under package metadata, really. Um, links does go in there right here. It needs to be known to the resolver because you're only allowed to have one crate in the dependency closure that links to any given um, shared library. Uh, and for package metadata, authors. Uh, so the authors and the description, basically anything that's free text. So authors, description, homepage, that kind of stuff doesn't go to the index, but it does go to publish. Why does it go to publish? It's a little unclear. Like arguably 
This could just be extracted from the crate file instead of being read as part of the JSON payload that gets submitted with the crate file. But this is probably partially because Crate.io doesn't want to have to parse the cargo toml. But maybe now that they can, that it no longer needs to come with the JSON payload as well. Um, although it's hard to remove after the fact. Hmm. So authors, description, homepage, documentation, readme, keywords, categories, license, license file, repository, resolver. Hmm. Well, so the resolver version I don't think goes in the publish. And I'm... And I'm fairly sure it doesn't go in the... Um, index either. So this is, there, there are multiple versions of the resolver. There's the cargo resolver version one and the cargo resolver version two. Um, and they have, um, there's a blog post about it. There are like a bunch of, um, there's a bunch of changes to how cargo interprets your dependency graph, graph how it unifies uh, version choices across, say, build and dev and normal dependencies. Um, now, the question here is whether this version field in the index is the same as the version of the resolver or whether it's just independently like a versioning for the index line. Um, this feels like it's not related to the resolver. Like reading the text, this seems to be more about um, the ability to make ba backwards incompatible changes to the index format itself. Um, so I don't think the resolver version makes it in here. The other thing that's interesting is it it looks like the JSON metadata doesn't include information about the index entry version. Which Which must mean that okay, so then the then the question becomes where does the V come from? So this would be in crates.io when it generates the index entry V. So that's just from crate. So when it creates the crate for the, for a publish, not a verified tarball, but somewhere up here it did, right? New crate. Mm. Encodable crate upload. Somewhere here, create exists. So this is looks up the crate by name to check whether this is a new crate or an up update, that's fine. Max upload size, but somewhere here, it must set the version. New version, right? And then add dependencies, update crate, that's updating keywords. Verify tarball, render and upload. V. 
features here. V. Well, where does V come from? Ah, so V is set depending on whether features 2 is empty or not. So this is something that we're going to have to encode in our, like this kind of logic, which is going from what was in publish dictates which version we're generating. And so this, this implies then that the, the, the V is unrelated to the resolver version and also well, it's related in the sense that only with a new resolver would you set features to in the first place, but it's not encoded in the upload information. Okay, so that means that if we go back to the dot .crate, the resolver version here is not relevant and we can get rid of it. Sweet. Okay, so we have dot .crate and the next step now is the, uh, the publish. So we're first gonna have to agree on like a, how, to, how to model these. Uh, and it's gonna be something along the lines of, I guess, create version. It could be called publish. Um, and we're gonna implement, want to implement from uh, super dot create normalized manifest for create version. And we also probably want to be able to go the other way around. Uh, no, we can't go the other way around. It's actually, I think it's a, I think it's a one way conversion. Uh, and we're gonna have to implement that at some point. And create version, we're gonna have the same kind of thing where we do tick A. And so now the question becomes, what definition of create version do we want to use? And I think the one where the, the data structures are the most important is gonna be the index one, because that's where I think the definitions in the crate index crate are particularly performance sensitive um, because there are so many instances of it. Whereas this published manifest, like there's only really one at a time. Um, so here, I think it probably doesn't matter which one we use. Mm. I guess we can start with the cargo one and then unify. <laughs> Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. I was trying to be smart to make a macro and instead I messed it up. That's also not what I wanted to do. There we go. Uh, did I mess up my macro? There we go. I love in macros, they're great. I'm tempted to just say we're not gonna send badges. We're not gonna send badges. Um, so that's gonna be one of these. And we're not gonna be fancy, we're just gonna call it dependency.
and love that. <laughs> I think you can put Sturdy Borrow here. Oh, I guess not. Too bad. Um, okay, so this is going to be a cow take a stir. And sorry, borrow, sorry, borrow, sorry, borrow, sorry, borrow, sorry, borrow, sorry, borrow. And actually, this reminds me, there's probably a couple of these where we want skip serializing if, skip serializing if, skip serializing if, skip serializing if. And probably up here too. So the skip serializing if is just, if this thing is none, then don't include the field in the message that you send. Although I don't think we actually do that, want to do that for the JSON payload because um, the receiving end might actually require it. It's interesting that it's specifically set on these though. So let's create version. These are all borrowed. Everything is happy. All right, so now we got to uh, combine this with the stuff from crates.io. So they want custom types for the names. The, the, so the, there's, there are a couple of paths we could take here, right? One is to say that we expect crates.io to adopt this data structure throughout their program for anything that's a crate upload, which would imply that like here, for example, we need to have our own custom uh, type for, uh, uh, you know, vetting that or validating that the format of the name is correct. The alternative is that we say, we expect them to deserialize into this and then after deserializing into this, they can then fallibly convert into their own type, which has you know special um, special types for all of these. That might be better rather than us trying to have you know generics for all of these. Is to say they're going to write a function that's going to be of the form uh, try from uh, you know cargo. What do we end up calling this? cargo index transit um, publish uh, crate version for encodable crate upload. They're going to write this. And in there, they're going to have all of their mappings of names and versions of whatnot to make sure that they conform to whatever requirements that they might have. But I, feel, I think that feels nicer than us trying to make all of our fields generic over types that they control. So I think actually that's the path I want to take. Um, okay, they have default on keywords and categories, which suggests that for keywords and categories, we can have Keywords, skip serializing if vec is empty. And we do the same thing for categories because we know that the crates IO side has default for them, uh, which also means that we can add default for them. Same thing here. It means that we want default for this and default for this which also should mean that they have default for those. Oh, they also have default for links. So we'll want to add that here. So what do they have? 
Oh, interesting. They don't have a default there. I think that's because option is treated specially. Option um, already basically implies default, I think. So I don't think they would have needed it on links. Uh, default does need to be set on Vex though. We should have tests for this though to make sure that that conversion actually does the same thing that they uh, expect it to do. Now, dependency kinds is another one of those where we want to think a little bit about what we want to do here. Because as far as cargo is concerned, uh, where is this? Steps, dependency. Dependency kind is just a string. But as far as crates.io is concerned, it has to have a particular set of values. So, so I think we actually want to keep that mapping that they have. Um, I don't know why they have the numbers. Oh, that's for mapping them to database IDs, which we don't need. Um, so we don't need the wrapper here. Um, but that way we can say uh, for dependency kind. So this doesn't need to borrow anymore. And this is now dependency kind. Okay. And the other thing that strikes me here is for encodable crate version, that's a semver version. Whereas currently cargo just treats it as a, a string. So I think here too, we're gonna say semver version. So we're gonna require that cargo sends it as a semver version and that um, crates that I will receive it as a semver version. Now here too, we, you know, we could have a cow here to say that if you already have the semver version somewhere, we're just gonna reuse that one for you. But but let's just leave it owned. I don't I don't not too concerned about it in the context of publish. Um, do we have anything else that's weird in here? So B tree map. This seems to be an agreement about features. That's probably because of ordering. So I guess actually what I probably want to do here is go field by field. Um, encodable crate name is a string and we encode it as a string. This we already dealt with. Depths is a vector of encodable crate dependency. Encodable, right, a vector of dependency, which is what we have up here too. Uh, it is a vector of dependency. So dependency has, let's grab this one. I just want to hoist it up here to see that I haven't like missed any fields or they're encoded differently. Optional is a bool. Okay, so that one we've dealt with. Default features is also here and it's a bool, that's fine. Name is an encodable crate name, which we know is just a string, so that's fine. Features is a vec of encodable features. Vec of strings, encodable feature is string, so that's fine. Version rec is encodable crate version rec. Uh, and encodable crate version rec is treated as a string by crates.io. Um, and version rec here is also a string. Th this one's also interesting because here, I think we can do better because we can say that this is a version rec and actually be provide this as a, a stronger requirement than just a string. Uh, target is a option string, option string. Kind, they have as an option dependency kind. So I guess this is an option of dependency kind. Although it's interesting because a cargo treats kind as just a string. It's not an option, it's not optional. So that makes me wonder, uh, Cargo and crates.io have this as string. 
uh, Crates.io has this as option, but I don't think it's actually an option. I think it's required. Um, and I guess for version, we should note that cargo has this as string. Um, so that's kind. Registry is an option string, so that's fine. Explicit name in Toml, encodable dependency name. An encodable dependency name is a string, which is a string here, and it's an option. So this explicit name in Toml is, it's sort of encoding the inverse of what we talked about for package, right? So uh, I gave the example of this. So in the cargo.toml, the structure is name equals, and then stuff package equals something. In the publish metadata, the way we encode this is dependency name nom, dependency version five, explicit name in toml for the dependency nom five. So the, 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 the mapping is inverted. And we'll, we'll see this pretty easily once we um, go up and, and, uh, and define this, this from. Um, all right, so now it's time to look at these. So we already looked at name and version and depths. Features is a B tree map of string to vector of string. Encodable feature name to encodable feature. Encodable feature name to feature. Those are all strings. So that matches. Description is an option string. That's what we have. Homepage is an option string. That's what we have. Documentation is an option string. That's what we have. Read me and read me file are both, both option strings. That's what we have. Encodable keyword list is vec encodable keyword. So it's a vec of string and keywords is a vec of string. And they have default, we have default and we don't include it if it's empty. So that seems fine. Categories, I'm gonna go with this the same vec of string. Okay, so these are all fine. License and license file are option strings. Repository is option string and links is option string with default. It doesn't need default, default is already none. Okay, so now this mod can go away and now we gotta just implement this bit, which is gonna be, uh, it's gonna emit a crate version. I'm gonna call this M because it's gonna be terser. So this is gonna be an M dot, oh, dot crate. All these fields have to be pub. And all the fields here have to be pub. And all the fields here have to be pub. Oh, so many. So this is gonna be m dot name. Package dot name. can't spell. Uh, this is going to be m.package.version. Depths, we'll get back to in a second. Uh, this is going to be m.features. It's going to be some m.features. Ah, it's an option here. So this is going to be unwrap or default. Um, although features and features two. Ah, so this bit we might actually need to, 
we're going to have to encode this bit for detecting what should go in features two and what should go in features. This stuff is, is like magic that's going to have to go in our conversion from this into index. Um, that's fine. Authors is going to be m.package.authors. And that's also going to be unwrap or default. Description is going to be m.package.description. Um, I love macros so much. Um, now readme is a string or bool here. So we're gonna have to map it. Uh, readme file keywords is gonna be an unwrap or default and same thing here. Uh, that's interesting. So, so readme has some special mapping here, which I think we saw in our prepare for publish. License file. Ah, I'm in the wrong one. I need to look at uh, registry publish. No, I need to look at the part of cargo that actually does the publish. Where did it go? I knew I had it here somewhere. Not the package part, but the actual publish part, which I thought was over here where we saw transmit. No. And this is the mapping of the manifest. Where on earth did I put transmit? Mm. <laughs> well, I'm going to have to go dig up where I had FN transmit. Uh, it's over here. Thought I had it open in a tab, but apparently not. Right. So this is the thing that actually generates the dependency list and the, uh, right. So the publish here. So what, you see, for a lot of it, it just copies the stuff out of the manifest. Dependencies is treated specially. Features is treated specially. And readme is treated specially. So what is readme here? Readme gets set to exactly what comes out of the manifest. Although that's a string or bool. Oh, right. And the, a bool here just means readme.md. I'm pretty sure. Um, we, we could look that up too and say, hey, is there mention of readme.md here? That's not what I wanted. Uh, is there a mention of that in source? <laughs> I want the contents readme.md, not files called readme.md. Uh, hmm. Here, probably. Ha! Readme for package. Uh, if it is set to true, that means readme.md. So this is going to be match on that. If it's some uh, string or bool, bool true. If 
it's false, then it's none. If it's this, then it's uh, cow bar. Well, I guess we can just do readme.md.into. Um, and none here maps to default readme from package root. I'm curious whether readme, does that even get called here? It doesn't get called here. So something must call it when it generates the manifest metadata somewhere. It's interesting. Um, so none is gonna be this default readme from package root, which tries all the files to see if they exist. Oh boy. Uh, so this one's tricky because it, um, depends on file contents in the dot .create file. Because we actually, what it gets set to is file system dependent. And I think the license file is the same actually. Because I think if we look at transmit here, um, Oh, it just complains if the license file doesn't exist. That's fine. But for readme, it actually includes the readme contents, which also depends on the... Yeah, so readme file gets set to readme. So actually I lied. It's the... Yeah, it's this. And readme gets set to readme. But readme is like the readme contents. And so this is gonna be a little weird to map. We could always just set it to none, right? But really it's supposed to be this. So that's very much of a, very much of a to-do here. Why does it, oh, right. Uh... So we're gonna have to figure out what to do about the readme because if all we're given is the parsed manifest, we don't have access to the files that were next to the manifest inside of the crate tarball. Um, uh, it might be that we just have to say none here. It, it's interesting too, because it feels weird for this logic to live in cargo on publish as opposed to in the thing that renders reads me's um hmm okay and then depths is clearly special because it has all this mapping that happens up here so let's see let depths um let's this is going to be depths let depths equals package load dependency so that's going to be m Ah, equals vec, and we're gonna do with capacity, m dot dependencies dot uh, map, btree map len, mm. So what I really want to write here, right, is something like plus, plus. 
That's what I want to write, but it's real ugly. Fine, we'll we'll leave it for now. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Actually, uh, we can do this in a better way, which is we can do m dot dependencies. Um, dot flat map dot chain m dot dev dependencies dot flat map d dot chain and the reason why it's better to use chain here is because at least in theory chain should be able to realize what the upper bounds or even what the size is of this iterator. Um, and so we shouldn't need to first collect into a vector. Um, dot flat map, uh, mean, which means I don't even need flat map, I just need map, uh, which really means it's into iter dot map here to into iter dot map. You'll notice that I, I do this a lot where I just write the code really far out to the right. Uh, and then I just let um, Rust format make it nicer for me afterwards. There you go. And then I can start actually doing something reasonable with it. So what do we do for these dependencies? Um, well, it says, Skip dev dependency without version. I wonder what this is for. <coughs> right, so anything that's transitive, which is not going to matter to us because we're only looking at the things that are in the manifest, which are direct dependencies by definition. Specified rec. What specified rec do? Okay, well that that's unhelpful. Inner. Specified rec. I see. Specified rec is just, does it have a version specified? But anything that's in the normalized manifest must already have version specified because anything that doesn't would already have been removed as part of the normalization. So we don't need that part. Um, Registry ID here. Um, oh. Need next web API and none means from the same registry, whereas in cargo.toml it means. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so. What this is saying is Okay, I'm going to map all of these uh, in a very simple way to be D dependency kind normal. So it's just going to be a tuple So this is dev and this is build and then we can dot map across all of them at the end so this is going to be now dependency it's very unhappy with me that's fine one of the found closures. 
Something's unhappy with me. What's this one of the found closures? Oh, I see. Mismatched types. Uh, right. So this has to be just like they do over here, a dot collect. That's fine. Now it should stop yelling at me. Okay. So whether it's optional is going to be D dot. Um, so I want to hear let D kind is D, which just means I can do D kind here because arguments are patterns. Um, so kind here is now this optional is D dot optional. Oh, right. D here is actually um, the name in Toml and the dependency definition. So explicit name in Toml is name in Toml. So this is where that inversion happens. And in fact, depths here, right, 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 right. So name here is going to be D dot package. Uh, default features is going to be D default features. Version rec is going to be D dot version rec which is just d dot version, right? If we go back to dot crate uh, for dependency, for dependency version is what gets set into version rec, target is d dot target, registry is d dot registry uh, URL. Right? What else are we missing here? Uh, features is D dot features. Expected B tree map. Interesting, why I messed up my types here somewhere. Expected B tree map. Oh, it's because this is an option. So unwrap or default on this, unwrap on default on that, unwrap or default on this. Okay, so what do we have here? Is optional. So is optional is defined as inner dot optional. Okay, that's relatively unhelpful. Uh, where does inner dot optional come from? Um, optional is false, new parse. So where does the <sighs> serialized dependency optional optional here is just a bool. So where does the default get set? I mean, we know the default is false. So if it's not set, it's false, right? So if optional is not true, then it's false because things are not optional by default. Um, default features is true by default. Um, uh, 
name. Okay, so this one's gonna be a little interesting. I guess for default features, it's probably gonna be the same kind of thing. It just delegates to the inner. Yep, so that's relatively uninteresting. Um, package name. is inner.name. The name of the package of this dependency depends on, usually this is what's written on the left-hand side of the dependency section, but it can also be renamed with the, via the package key. Both of the dependencies below return foo for package name. Right, so this is, um, if the package name is specified, then that is the name of the, the true name of the dependency. Um, Otherwise, it is name in Toml. Um, features. We want a vec of features, and this is just an unwrap or default. That's easy enough. Version rec is version, target is target, kind is kind. Um, target is platform, that's fine. This is where that mapping happens to dependency kind. Registry is dep registry, which we're going to have a look at. An explicit name in Toml is name in Toml. So this is actually if no, this is always the name in Toml, right? Or is <laughs> so? Here's a question. This is supposed to be an option. When is it set? to none. Explicit name in Toml. Is this like if they differ? If the package key is used, then this returns the same value as name in Toml. Okay, so this is only this is only set to sum if package is set. So this is if Okay, so we can actually make this a little bit nicer for ourselves by saying let uh, explicit name and name be match uh, name in Toml and d dot name uh, d dot package and then this is now going to be name it's going to be name. This is going to be explicit name. Uh, and here we're going to say if package is sum and name is sum, then the explicit name is the name and the name is the package name. If the pack, if the if the name is set but package is not, then the explicit name is none, and the name is the name that was specified. So to make this a little clearer, perhaps this is a uh, explicit name equals package equals name. This is a explicit name equals nothing. This is always n. And I think 
those are just the only two cases, right? Now the question is, if you specify, if you use this syntax, but use the same name here and here, should it be some or none? Um, okay, and then what happens to registry URL? So that's dep registry, which is an interesting mapping. If the dependency is from a different registry, then include registry in the dependency. If the, in the index and web API, none means from the same registry, whereas in cargo toml, it, ref, it means from crates.io. Right, so here when we say, when registry index is set to none here, what that means is fetch it from crates.io. If it's set to none in the dependency specification that gets sent to crates.io, it means this is not from a different registry. That's what they're saying here. So the way we're gonna have to structure this is something like, uh, let's see, dep is to do for now. Uh, registry dep, which is to say, um, we're going to match on d dot registry. If it's at the sum, then that means not necessarily from crates.io. If it's at the none, that means from crates.io. Right, and then this is where it gets complicated, which is if it's from crates.io, then we actually need to Okay, so here we actually need to know, ah, this is annoying. So this conversion can't quite be this simple because the JSON payload we send here differs depending on what registry you're sending it to. If you're sending it to crates.io, then crates.io dependencies will have none set as their registry. Oh, that's awful. Uh, it makes me very sad. Um, ah, so this isn't a pure conversion. All right. So that means this is going to be something like simple this. And we're going to have to take a f uh, is for, and that's going to be the registry ID which if it's crates IO URL is Ah, dep. Oh no, I lost my place in the file. This file is too big. Uh, somewhere over here. Yes. Okay, I found it. Let me do this. Um. So what I want here is for this thing. This then uses the URL of this, which is this URL, which is this URL. So 
So this then is going to be is from here. Actually, this can just be this, uh, then R is from target registry. Uh, so this is going to be target, uh, target registry dependent source registry. It's a really weird field. Um, it's going to be if is from is equal for is f is equal to is for then none else sum is from target regist target registry dependent source registry right and this then is going to be cal borrowed Whew. That does make me really sad that it's not a, a, a straight up conversion. I still don't know what to do about the readme actually, because like this is also a to-do, right? It's so like a match on. Uh, read me, read me contents. <laughs> what? I don't understand why why is it complaining about these? Oh, and stringer bool in dot crate needs to be public. Uh, so we're gonna do pub use deser stringer bool. Uh, expected option found wait this should be fine to do matches every type oh also i looks like i don't need chrono anymore that's nice but what if i swap these well, why is it complaining that the match arms have different types? This to do should match that none. Oh, I wonder if it's... Okay, so let's read me options. Yeah, it's probably this. So I need something like uh, cow ticket stir. No, it still won't let me do it. Type option that expected enum option. But, but the never type should should be compatible with option. Interesting. What if I do like to do to do? Is it is it okay with that? No? Ah <sighs> sigh.
That's interesting. I don't know why it won't let me compile this code. I, I guess I can just do this and then do like this. It's not what I want, but See, this is the reason why I didn't want it, is because I then... Ah, uh, fine, okay. How about if I do this? Is it gonna let me do... Read readme.md. If I make this not an option... What, that's fine? And also, what do you mean that's a non-exhaustive pattern? Some string. Oh, right, of course. String path. Cannot return value referencing local data D registry index. Uh, Right, we're because we're consuming this one. But so the reason this gets weird is because registry index here should be a it's a cow stir, but it should have the lifetime of tick A already because that's what we're both giving in and giving back. So I think that's a lie. Oh, I I guess it's because it's not borrowed as to be taken ownership of. And then this can be this. And this is going to be cow borrowed. Great. Compiles. I mean, we still don't know what to do about the readme, but... But I'm going to go ahead and ignore that for now because I like ignoring things. Um, okay, let's move to index. Oh, so index is going to be probably the biggest pain here because, because of all the optimizations that we've said. Um, I'm inclined to start with the cargo type here because ultimately, if you stick something in the index, the cargo doesn't understand, then people aren't relying on it because they wouldn't be able to build it. So the cargo one must be right here, uh, at least when it comes to deserialization. Um, so that's what I want to start with. Now, the intern string here. So the problem with something like this here is that true it means that you can continue to reference what's in the um, the you know JSON byte buffer that you originally parsed. The downside is that that might go away, right? Imagine you're you're writing the resolver and as part of it you're reading a bunch of index files. You're probably not keeping all of the read files in memory as you go. You're going to read a file, parse it, and then drop the file, but still want to keep the index reference. So at that point, like you're going to have to turn this into, uh, into an owned version of itself. But at that point, you're just allocating a string, which is what we want intern string for. Um, so... The question then becomes, how do we want to represent this? This is also the place where we have the most of like the, the smallster stuff that is in, um, 
in the crates index crate. Here it is kind of tempting to make basically all of them be um, be generic. Now there's a question of should they all require it to be the same generic or can they be different? <laughs> I think they might have to be different because this is another case, right? Where like the version here really is supposed to be a Semver version, but in the crates index case, I don't think they actually want to store Semver versions because they are relatively large, right? Like they're a vector of comparisons, which are themselves not tiny. I guess a vector is small, but hmm. Smallster probably does pretty well actually with semantic versioning requirements because very often they're very short strings. So this, this does feel a lot like a case of let every use of this dictate its own type for most of the types. It's also very interesting to me that the cargo uses intern strings for all the features, whereas like crates index does not, you know, it, it uses just, just straight up strings. Uh, it might be because in cargo, the crate name and the crate features end up being like copied in a bunch of places by the resolver because it needs to keep track of what features it's enabled and everything. So, so they actually get cloned a lot. Um, whereas something like the checksum, for example, does not. It, it gets read and checked once and then, the, then it basically gets ignored from that point forward. So my suspicion here is that it makes a lot of sense for cargo to treat features as intern strings and it doesn't really make sense for crates index because it's already behind like a, a map abstraction. So it's already small. Um, I think the way I want to structure this is I'm gonna start from the cargo one and I'm gonna say that we have a couple of generics. We have name, version, and features. And And then I'm going to disagree that this is a string. I'm going to agree with crates index that this is a checksum that is hex encoded. Um, yanked is an option bool. Yeah, this doesn't need to be an option. And even if it did, um, it can just have default set. It's interesting that links is treated separately. What does crates index encode links as? It's a small string, yeah. So I, I think links then ends up being separate again. It's tempting to make it similar to features. I don't think there's a strong reason not to, but like in Cargo, for example, car Cargo uses the same for, I guess, Cargo uses the same for them. 
Ah, but crates index does not use the same thing for links as it uses for features. It actually uses the same thing it uses for name, which cargo also does, but tying them to name seems weird. So let's do links and say that links here is gonna be this. Okay. And then the next question is for these, for features, it does need to be a B tree map. I, I don't think I agree with crates index, which says it's a, that it's a hash map, but crate index, um, wraps this behind an option box to make it smaller. So one, one question here is whether these optimizations also make sense for cargo, right? Like cargo is not going to complain if things get faster. So we don't, we don't need to have an exact um, mapping to the way that cargo holds this data at the moment. Um, to reduce the size of the start when the field is unused, that is almost always. I don't think it's true that it's almost always unused anymore because features two. Oh, right. Features two is only for things that newer cargo understands. So if we go back to the crates IO code here, features two is anything that is a, a weak dependency. And there are relatively few weak dependencies. So usually the list of things that goes into features two is empty. Right. So I, I think I agree with this part that uh, features two can probably be an option. And, you know, making it a box it's wrapped in a box to reduce size so we'll do I think we'll do this I think I, I think I like that idea um And then for features, there's a, it uses arc. I'm curious why it uses arc for features. I mean, I guess arc and clone are basically equivalent really uh, in this kind of use. The question is how often do you wanna clone the set of features? I wonder if there's an explanation for this. Like if we go to uh, Rust Crates Index and we look at source lib, I wanna look at the blame for features. This seems to be the thing that moved everything to have arcs. Lower memory usage by deep duplicating versions data. What confuses me here is where does the deduplication? Oh, I see. That's sneaky. Okay, so this is primarily useful for crates index, which is when it parses the list of versions. The observation here is that for a lot of, you know, new crate versions, the list of features is exactly the same. So rather than store them multiple times, you just reference count it and store the reference counted one multiple times. I, I totally buy that. I, I totally buy that that's useful. And, and arguably for the dependency list too. Um, so here's what I want to do here. I want to say that it seems totally reasonable for this to be an arc and it seems totally reasonable for this to be an arc. 
these are arc because of uh, these are arc they can be deduplicated easily uh, by calling code if um, happen to be uh, reading in all of the versions of a single crate at once as versions often share dependency and feature as similar versions, nearby versions. Where uh, name implements serialize and deserialize. version, I guess feature is really the end link, links. A feature also have to implement ORD. Feature, 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 feature. Why? And this is just, oh, uh, use standard from debug. Interesting. Oh, why ARC and not RC? Um, ARC is just more useful than RC. Like if it's RC, then there's no way for people to make it thread safe on their own. But if it's ARC, you're paying a little bit more cost if you're in a single threaded context. But in your, if you're in a single threaded context, it probably doesn't matter to you anyway. Um, Oh, right. I forgot about this. So this is where we also need Serde, oh boy. Sorry, this is gonna be bright. So Serde has a special thing that you can use if you want to use generics in your type, uh, which is what we want here. Uh, it's the bound thing, uh, but that's not what I wanted. I wanted, I was hoping there was a way for me to just say also include this lifetime, but I guess not. Don't really want to have to rewrite the bounds myself. All right, I'll leave that for in a second. Um, okay, so name and version are configurable. Dependencies. Features, features two doesn't need the deduplication, so we keep it as a box so that we have ownership of it. The checksum, yanked. Um, links, schema version. This really doesn't need to be a U32. This can be a U8. Uh, what does crates index, what else does crates index has? Is an arc over dependency such that it is not a vec, it is a slice. That seems fine because these dependencies um, don't need to grow and shrink. It doesn't actually need to be a vector. Um, and that saves you a little bit of space. That seems reasonable to me. 
Um, it's interesting to me that this is an option box because for links, I don't think we need to box here because we can always say that for um, when crates index uses our crate, they can just set links to be box molster. So that box probably isn't necessary. What do they have for V? They don't even decode V, which is interesting. Uh, okay, so that can go away now. And for dependency, Serialize, deserialize, debug. Um, there's an argument here that this no longer needs to be generic over A. Actually, because now all the relevant types are controlled by the caller anyway. Right, those bounds are generated by 30 anyway. So that's fine. This doesn't need to borrow. This doesn't need to, uh, that needs to be generic probably over, uh, probably over name, probably over feature. Cause you'll want the same string representation in here. So what do we have, what do they use down here? Uh, right, dependency kind we already have. So we have dependency kind, does it need to be an option? Uh, this is super dot create depend, mm, publish. Dependency kind. They use for, f it's interesting. So for the inner features, they use a different representation than for the outer ones. Box, box, slice. Oh. Yes, I mean, this is all optimized for compactness over performance. Um, but it's because usually, you know, you have a bunch of these fields you're deserializing, but a lot of them you're not even going to look at. And so you would rather them not take up a lot of space so you can, you know, walk the memory more efficiently, for example, than you want to have the maximal performance when accessing any given field because you're going to be accessing relatively few things. Um, so... Oh, public is here. So I suppose that means I lied when I previously said that dependencies weren't public. That's frustrating. Uh... Because it does show up in the index right here. So that means the dependency here, which we got over from crates.io in dot crate, which is manifest toml. All dependencies are 
private by default. Uh, Tomo manifest dependency. So, where do we have Tomo dependency? Detailed Tomo dependency. Right, public here is a nope, pub public. Option bool and I think that can does that even go into new crate? That's the other thing I want to know. Uh, new crate. Yeah, see, so it's not currently even sent as part of the it's not published, but it goes, does go in the index, which is interesting. Uh, so it's not a part of publish, but it is a part of dot create. Public is self dot public dot and in publish it just ignores that because it doesn't go anywhere. And then for index, right, so now we're back to index. Um, I'm torn here what to do with I think you know this this can certainly be box list of feature, not sure why it's box box. It's box box because this is a slice, which means it's a dynamically sized type, which means that box here is actually a fat pointer that holds both the pointer and the length of the slice, which means that this is two U sizes, whereas a Box box is one U size large, um, but that could be remedied by doing this. That has the same effect. Um, although the uh, vec here, <laughs> I mean, we could do the computation, right? So a, a vec of feature is a U size for the length a U size for the capacity and a U size for the pointer. A box vec feature is a U size for the pointer only. A box of slice feature is a U size for the pointer and a U size for the length. And a box box feature is a U size for the pointer only. So box vec, vec feature and box box slice feature are the same size, but inside of the pointer here, this is a U size pointer and a U size length. This is a U size pointer and a U size length and a U size capacity. So the hence box box feature. Right, so this one uses less heap memory than this one does. And there's an argument here for that means this should be the same.
I'm curious what they do for... I don't understand why I removed that original code from registry index. Uh, that is over here. Uh, 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 not dependency, but the top level definition. They still use vec strings for the features inside of here. I guess it's because once you arc them, they're they're less costly. But you know, you you could trim some by doing this. Um, but maybe it's just not worth it. Like if you really want to trim here, you you can do that. Um, okay. So, back to this. So now there's a question of, for requirements, they actually do need to have a different type than the version. Um, because one is a semantic version, one is a semantic version requirement, and they're, they're just not the same. Um, so for rec, we're gonna take rec here, and this is gonna be rec. Um, and I'm guessing for target, yeah, so for target and for package, for both of them, they're using box of small string. Now, I don't think small string helps you here because package and target are both usually fairly long. Are they longer than a U size? So target is usually something like x86, 64, unknown Linux GNU. Uh, a U size is 64 bits, which is eight bytes, which is roughly eight characters. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? So that's not gonna capture your target. Um, and same thing for package. Package is gonna be the name of the crate. So that one might, like if it's nom, for example, or fit fine into small string. Um, but yeah, I guess for, for package, it might make sense. Like small string might be able to save you some of the time. Um, for target, I don't think it matters. So this now gets back to, you know, to what extent do we want these to be uh, do, 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 things like the features to be tied back to the input source. And I think actually Cargo has the same need here as crates index diff, which is the input that you have, the JSON input is not going to be long lived enough that it makes, that, that you get any value from having this tie back to the lifetime of the JSON file. Uh, and so as a result, I don't think we actually need to worry about that. I don't think we, I don't think there's a lot of value here in being able to do um, input variant or imp, uh, deserialization that's not owned. Because um, usually you want this to be longer lived anyway. Um, so in that case, the target here, target I think might as well just be, um, I mean, I guess it could be a box stir, right? So this again saves one U size compared to uh, string. And we could make the argument that this is, target is set rarely enough that you wanna box box it because you wanna save that extra byte um, anytime it is set, anytime it isn't set. Um, which I'm actually surprised given crates indexes optimization here Target feels like a good candidate for an extra boxing. Um, now package, package is set um, frequently, is, is not set very frequently either. Uh, it also feels like it should be tied to name. The question is whether we should box it because it's used rarely. Uh, sure, why not? Now, 
Now, this feature list is interesting because I guess the question is how often do people pass features for their dependencies? And I think that's decently common. But again, it's about having the most compact representation for that feature list, depending on how often you think you're actually going to access it. I think this is probably fine. Um, now for targets, do we want to allow people to swap in their own versions here? I do you feel like this actually in, um, certainly in cargo, this might make sense as an intern string because there are very few targets. Um, so I think we're going to make this be generic. So that means there's now also target. Not track it, target. Uh, and so target goes into here. Target goes into there, the target went there. Registry, this one I think is very rarely. This one's very, very rarely set because usually the dependencies of a thing in a registry are from the same registry. It's very rare they're gonna point anywhere else. I wonder whether they even bother to deserialize it here. Yeah, see, they don't even bother deserializing it because it's just, it's so rarely set. Um, and in fact, I forget whether Crates.io even allows you to have cross-registry dependencies. But this certainly feels like one of those, like we should at most be st spending a use size on it. Um, I wish we could spend less, but I don't think we can afford to go quite as far as uh, Crates Index does because we do actually need to store this information because if it's set, it's relevant. Um, okay, so we have option dependency kind. I don't actually think this needs to be an option, but it doesn't matter. It'll get a niche optimization anyway, because there are fewer than, fewer than 256 variants of this enum. Um, Okay, and public, what did they say? Public defaults to somewhere over here. Too many tabs now. Public defaults to false. So that means this can be default, uh, 30. Default. Or actually, I guess that means in the dot crate is really where that goes. In fact, yeah, so public here, I guess this is reading things out of the index. So this is saying if it's not set in the index, then assume that it's false. So in the index, it would still be an option because you care whether it's explicitly set to false or explicitly set to true because we we don't know the default in cargo might actually change. Okay, so now next question is, uh, Right, so these for dependency kind, I guess we might as well um, be nice to people and bring over some docs here. And we can also be even better and implement all the different nice things. Um, 
This skips serializing on package kind and target. Package kind and target. In which case that would mean that we also need to derive default for them. Um, although I don't think there's actually a meaningful default for kind. But if it's not set, then we want to preserve the fact that it's not set. Uh, okay. Great. So now I think we, we're aligned with crates index. So they could switch to ours now. They have all the information. Uh, next is checking that this all still works with what crates IO needs. So this is the definition from crates IO. Oops. Let's see that that matches up with this. So create name, they use a string, they use a string for the version. Both of those are fine. We allow them to be generic over them and they can, they can be the same or they can be different. Vec of dependency, we encode that as an arc of a slice of dependencies, but that should be fine for them. Uh, we'll check whether the actual uh, registries are the same later. Uh, dependency types are defined later. For checksum, they store it as a string. We actually parse it as a U832, which should be fine. Um, it does mean that for them to get it out as a string, it would have to be parsed out, but that's probably fine. I'm intrigued by the decision to store this as 32 U8s because this feels like a thing you might want to box because you're then you're storing a lot less for each one, but you are also using a bunch of memory for every field. Um, which is like 32 bytes is like a non-trivial amount of storage. Um, so the checksum, that seems fine. Features, they store as a map from string to string. We store it as an arc map and they can choose string to string, so that's fine. Um, this bit, let's add, oh, they've actually copy pasted exactly the definition from cargo. So that's nice. Uh, and those are the same. It's an option. It's just that for us, it's an option box, which seems fine. Uh, yanked for them is an option bool. We've made it a bool that implements default because if the field is missing from the index, the field should always be in the index. And if it's not in the index, you should interpret it as not being yanked. So I think that's right. Uh, links, they have as an option string. We have it as an option link, so they can set that to string. That's fine. They have skip serialize on it, which we do not. Um, but we should we should have that because that is the new behavior that is the behavior of crates IO when it generates the index as we just saw and so therefore we should behave the same. Uh, the schema version this is just copy pasted. They use a U32. We use a U8. That seems fine. Um, and we want to skip that if it's set to none. And that's all there is to crate. And now let's compare their definition of a dependency to ours. Name is name, rec is string for them, that's fine. Those match. For features, they use a vec of string. We use a box box string of feature, which is fine. Those are compatible. Uh, optional bool, that's fine. Default features, that's fine. Target for them is an option string. For option, it's an op For us, it's an option box target. So they could set target to just be stir and be happy. Kind for them is an option dependency kind, and for us is an option dependency kind, that's fine. 
and pa we have package, which they also have. We have default, which we don't need. Did that come from the definition in in um, in here? Did they have default set for package? They no. So I just made that up. Okay, great. So that one's done. They have partial eek and eek set. That seems fine. We can have partial eek and eek. Box slice does not implement serialize. We'll have to look at that in a second. Now, they also have an implementation of partial ord for dependency, which seems useful. Uh, and they have this, which looks like it's mostly the same, except they have ord, they don't have hash, we'll add hash. So that's the union of them. Okay, so partial ord for registry dependency. So we want to here do where where name impulse ord and rec impulse ord. Because those are the only things we're actually comparing. Interesting. Uh, why is the requirement on eek here? All right, let's see what cargo checks us. I want something more substantial here. Whoa. A lot of stuff. Can't compare feature with feature. Partial ord. Why does it need to compare feature with feature? I forget whether ord. Right. Ord implies eek. And up here, by deriving partial eek and eek. We're getting an implicit dependency that features imp impulse eek because otherwise it can't do the comparison here. So it is interesting that ordering doesn't look at features at all. In old cargo versions, the dependency order appears to matter if the same dependency exists twice but with different kind fields. The option field gets to be ignored. I see, so this is a partial ordering. So they're actually kind of lying here. Like this is not really okay. Because um, I think all the other fields also need to be ordered by. But name, kind, and rec. Name, kind, and rec. I think all you need to do is this. Ord, because then we can take uh, this and say this um, by placing the fields in this order, we ensure that the same that uh, by placing the fields in this order, we ensure that uh, we get the right. We ensure that we sort by kind 
before version. Now we we ensure that normal dependencies is always first when multiple by the same name exists. And that is assuming that in dependency kind we have normal defined first, which we do. And this stems from the fact that the the derive for um, ordering is order by the fields in the order that they appear. And I believe that's not a thing they can change. I mean, who knows, but at least in theory, that shouldn't be a thing they can change. Uh, I mean, there's a, it should be easy enough to test this. Like if we do, you know, um, uh, derive partial ord, ord debug, and I do struct uh, s, and we have field zero, which is a use size, and field one, which is a use size, and field two, which is a use size. Then if I do this, and I do print line, I guess, uh, mute v is a vec of things, v I'm going to sort, and then I'm going to print out v. Um, then if I now do something like s, let me make these a little more convenient for myself, f1, f2, f0 is 0, f1 is 1, F2 is 2. <laughs> well, that, that was silly. Um, uh, let me close the door a little more. So we would expect here, I guess I can make this a test instead. Okay. Uh, or the good old it works. So what we expect to see that is that it sorts by field zero first. So if I do, um, you know, five, four, three, two, one. Um, I do one, two, three, four, five, oh, zero, one, two, three, four, five. I do, I don't know, one, two, one, one, two. Then I'm expecting that this is equal to forget whether default sorting is ascending or descending. Can't compare S with S. Okay, that's fine. Eek, partial eek. Tools, must format, test. Test run failed. Okay, so it's ascending by default. Uh, oh, this is awful. Uh, so this should come before this, should come before this, should come before this. <laughs> Miso, did you want to come in? Oh, hi, Chai. Oh, I'm sorry, did I lock you out? I'm sorry. You're going to grumble now? Okay, here you go. Uh, so zero, do, 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 do. this goes up here. So zero, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so that test passes. It could be non-deterministic, but it seems to be ordering by the fields in order when you derive ord. Now, can we rely on that? Who knows? But I think we can. 
or rather, if they were to try to change this, I think they'd run into a problem. I think the guarantee here is that the ordering of the fields is equivalent to as if you had a tuple of those fields in that same order. Uh, which means that just by placing them in this order, we guaranteed that all the normal dependencies come first, regardless of the version numbers. Um, and now this is complaining about something. It's complaining that well, first of all, it's complaining about a bunch of unused dependencies or uses like this. Uh, does it still work if you swap the ordering? That's a great question. So if I do this and put F1 there and run test, nope, test fails. Because then it, now it's ordering by F1. Um, deserialize is not implemented for box slice. Interesting. Is there another feature of Surti I have to turn on here? Because again, here, that derive seems to work just fine. So if I go over here and look at the cargo toml, their dependency on cert is just RC. So why don't I get to do the fun thing? They have arc of slice of dependency. I have arc of slice of generic dependency. But I don't get to have mine. Why? Name rec feature target. Hmm. Uh, oh, the docs on Rust stable says the derive ord works like that. Okay, great. They don't have a manual derive, right? They don't have a manual implementation. They just derive serialize. And it's the same for dependency for them. But theirs isn't generic. So that's that's where I feel like this probably comes from. Um, name. Oh, I wonder if it's um, rec feature target links. So I should only need feature ord. Because that's the only bound I have that the derive wouldn't realize. I'm pretty sure that this is Surte getting confused. So if I do uh, Surte bound equals this, it's going to complain about all sorts of things, right? And it's going to complain about name deserialize. Can I keep them separate? Oh, that's awful. That's awful. So I'm going to have to do like this. Can I, can I avoid giving them all as one big string? Okay. 
So I'm gonna have to do this. And I, I think I know why this is too, but I'll, I'll, uh, let me just see that it works first. Uh, so this is gonna be version. Can I at least do this? I should be able to, cause it's just gonna be injected verbatim. So name version rec feature target links. Oh boy. Is it gonna let me do that? I'm not sure why it won't let me do this. So so the reason why it's complaining here is because um, I think it's only because of rec and target. Uh, so so in, in particular, I think I can fix this by saying uh, unused one is phantom data rec and unused two is phantom data target. Really? Name version rec feature Oh, interesting. So it's not that. Why? Oh man, it's very strange. Oh, I also just realized all of these have to be pub. Uh, Certy rename equals burr. Let's make these nice to work with. Dependencies. I think this is also for what is worth the reason why uh, creates index. Um, exposes these only through getters and setters is because that way they can hide the fact that behind the scenes is like an arc and a double box and stuff behind this, right? Um, so it, it, it is tempting for us to do the same thing. Um, but I'm going to make it Pub for now. Let's check some. Links. And this is pub V. And I guess we can rename this to be. Um, it's like schema, of, well, it's V, uh, but it's schema version. Um, and then this, oh, is it because I didn't make it pub? This is pub, right? Yeah, pub. And then this is pub, pub, rename. Pub features, pub optional target, registry, package, and public. Well, 
What's interesting is it says the trait bind box isn't implemented. So my guess is that surdays derived for arc depends on surdays derived for box. And surdays derived from box, my, I feel like it just doesn't handle the generics, but why not? Um, box of that deserialize is not satisfied. I mean, like, I, I, I guess I could do this. David Tolnay would scream at me if he saw this. Uh, yeah, I, I know, I know, I know. So this, <laughs> okay, so there is a line in the survey docs that says uh, these realize are lifetimes. Uh, where is it? I thought there was a line here that said something about like, if you ever put four next to your thing, you're doing it wrong. Um, Actually, you know what? I wonder whether, st stupid as it may seem, I need Surde borrow here. Or something along those lines, because I, I might have to tell it that this is... Um, the current... This isn't about the lifetimes either. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm unsure why this wouldn't implement deserialize. Because it should be the case that... This bound should be like inferred by Surdy here. I, I guess like this is a trivial thing to test, right? We write a test that we can deserialize this when the 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 type instances are reasonable. Um, okay. Let's just assume that's right for now to see if we can make some progress. So now thing we want to do is we want to implement a conversion from new manifest to this and from the published metadata to this. And it'll, it'll be interesting actually to see whether we can. So if everything works the way we hope, we should be able to implement from publish crate version for uh, whatever we call this thing, which is registry package, which is I don't really love. Entry for entry. And I guess this is gonna take all the same generics as over here. Where name is gonna to have to implement like from cow take a stir and same thing for version and same thing for all the other ones actually rec 
feature, target, and links. And feature also has to implement ORD. Oh, cargo expand isn't a good idea. That might actually tell us what's going wrong. Um, so the name is going to be v dot name dot into v dot version dot into uh, features and features two. So that's the part that we were looking at over here. is v dot features into iter schema version. So that's schema version dealt with and features two dealt with. So, <laughs> It's very unhappy with me with the bounds up here. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, so this should just be features. This should be v dot. Ah, so the checksum we don't have because that's not in the crate version stuff. Um, yanked is though. No, yanked is also not in that. Uh, if you have a crate version, the assumption is always that it is not yanked because yank is an operation on the registry. So anytime someone publishes you a crate version, it is not yanked because it was just published. Um, and links is going to be v.links dot map. Uh, And really, this should be into name. Generally, you're supposed to use into for bounds. This could also have been a mechanical change, I suppose. So, uh, so that's features. So checksum we can't. Dependencies we should be able to. So actually here I'm going to go back here and say that we're going to make this also be nicer. Rename equals verge. And then say this is version. Rename equals depths and say that this is dependencies. And then this is going to be v dot dependencies. Dot map, right? And this is going to be an arc new uh, this dot map, whatever it ends up being dot collect. And this is going to have to be a registry dependency. And let's see if we can come up with all the fields that go in here based on what's in the publish that we got. Well, this should be D dot name. This should be d.kind. This should be d.version. Although, create version dependencies. So for dependencies down here, this is version rec currently. Let's make that nicer too. Rename. 
I'm surprised that this is named version underscore rec. Is that right? It really is. Wow. Okay. Uh, so that's going to be requirements. Right. And in the index, so here we have to invert again, right? Because this wants package and name and doesn't want the explicit name and Tomal bit. Uh, so back to another map like this, where we're going to say let name and package is match on d dot name and d dot explicit name in Tomal. Um, so this is going to be either name and sum. So let's see. So it's either that or it is this. So if there's no explicit name, then the then the name is n and the package is none. And if there's a name, an explicit name, then the name is the thing in the explicit Tomal, and the package is the thing that was the name. Nice. So that's name and package dealt with. Now registry here, the question now is whether we also need to invert registry. I honestly have no idea. What is, what does it stick inside of that? So it's the version string, checksum features and features two, which we already dealt with, yanked is false. Oh, right, we already, this is the, the outer fields. So yanked is false, links we dealt with, features we dealt with, great. So for the dependency stuff, that mapping happens, git depths. Git depths is add dependencies. What does add dependencies do? Fetches all the stuff from the database. All right, so this is the same inversion we do. If we're generating a dependency. That's just the version requirement from the thing that came in. The feature list is just the feature list mapped to strings, which is already what we have. Optional is just d dot optional. Default features is d dot default features. Target is d dot target. Registry. Registry doesn't even get set here. So this suggests that crates.io just does not allow cross registry dependencies because in its index entries, it never writes out registry. So presumably then in the upload path somewhere around here, I wonder if it looks through the dependency list and checks that none of them have registry set. Or maybe just assumes that they don't. Well, it's so whatever comes back from add dependencies. Yeah, here. Dependencies hosted on another registry. Cross registry dependencies are not permitted on crates.io. 
Which is a little awkward for us because it means we don't really know what this mapping should be. It's not clear whether cargo expects the thing that's in the index to remember how there's a difference between how it's treated in the in the cargo.toml dependency definition and how it's defined in the metadata that we send in the JSON payload. In one, the registry isn't set if it's crates.io. In the other, it isn't set if it's the current registry. I feel like it's probably the current registry that applies here too, which is the same thing that's in D because that's what the registry received. And public is probably just d.public. And now it's complaining, and it's complaining about the same thing. Implicitly alighted. Oh. The trait box is not satisfied. Deserialize is not implemented for box of that. I want to know why. Oh, I haven't called into on all of these, have I? Uh, right, 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 right. So I'm going to have to do. Uh, oh, boy. Yeah, all of these are going to need into calls. Um, we'll deal with that in a second. So. Yeah, this all comes back to this bit. So if I run cargo expand, what do I get? Oh boy, uh, this is long, 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 long. I need to know what to search for because otherwise it's going to be impossible to deal with this uh, for entry. All right, impl serialize for entry, impl deserialize for entry. So it correctly adds the, the DE bound to all of the generics. Now, where's the part where deserializes the field that we worry about, which is field number zero, one, two. Okay, so field two, where does it handle field two? Depths is field two. Field one, field two. Next element is an arc of that. Okay. So I guess then we need to look at the implementation uh, for registry dependency. That also seems reasonable. It implements deserialize when all of its generic arguments implement deserialize over the target DE. Why is the requirement on target to be default? I want to know what this default business is. Oh, no default. Aha! I don't know if that did it, but I think I think that might actually have done it. That there was a requirement. The default ended up meaning that target had to implement default, but we don't require that here. 
and it's a survey bound, right? Survey default. So it's not a problem for Rust itself that target didn't implement default here, and even though we contain one, but for the implementation of deserialized cert, it thought it would was. And I guess this means that when you declare default on something that's an option, it, it assumes that it should be some of default of the target type rather than none. That's weird. All right, well, I guess that fixed it. Cargo expand to the rescue, I suppose. Um, all right, what else do we have? Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Version from version is not satisfied. V. Oh, actually, I guess there's no need for the into. Because, well, so this is weird. I, I guess the conversion here is just this. Right? All of these are just this. There, there's no generics involved. Because we're just saying we can construct a crate version from an entry. If you have a crate version, we can construct an entry where all of the things are just the same kinds of references that you had in your crate version JSON. If you wanted to convert those to more special types for yourself, that's fine. Um, but for the conversion, like the we want the one-to-one -one conversion. Found version expected cowster. Oh, right, uh, uh, name version. So the thing that comes out of version here is a semver version. And the thing that comes out of requirements is a semver version rec. Uh, dependencies is not an iterator. Sure it is. Oh boy. Uh, arc new size for values. This is going to be a collect dot into box slice, box slice, and then this is going to be an arc from. Uh, so the kind here, that's going to map to a sum. The features here, right, we're insane people and decided to have this be into boxed slice box new target map box new map box am I lying? <laughs> right. This is double boxed for reasons. In fact, this one is um, two boxed string, two boxed stir. I'll map, so we're going to map the registry to a boxed stir like this. Uh, and this is into owned dot to box stir. So this gives us a string because R here is a cow stir. So this gives us a string. And then this is dot to, there's definitely supposed to be a boxed stir. Yeah, string in 
into Boxster. Okay. Uh, and then we box that again. That seems fine. Package is supposed to be an option of a box of a name. Ah, because usually this is going to be nothing. Okay. Uh, public. Right. Public is not currently in the JSON and therefore it has to be none. Even if it might be some in the original dot crate, it's not a part of the JSON upload fields. Like so. Uh, features. This is where we need to do our fancy mapping, which is just arc features is arc new of features and features two is features two dot uh, dot map box new and the checksum we still don't have so this is where this conversion doesn't work which is we can only do this conversion if you also give us the checksum. So we're going to have to do um, this. And this is going to be a pubfn new, which takes a crate version and a checksum. Uh, and the checksum is going to be a U832. Like so. All right, so now we have that conversion. And that means we have from dot .crate to publish to index. Now, in theory, we could also define a conversion, I think, from dot .crate directly to entry. So this is from publish. Um, and then we could also have a from manifest, which could be useful for things like uh, the internal testing in cargo, right? from manifest, which is a dot .crate normalized manifest. And that also needs to check some. Uh, and it's going to have a similar kind of thing uh, where we do this. Now, this is going to have v.package.name v.package.version. Uh, we no longer need to do this mapping because here the mapping is direct. So name is just going to be v. Uh, no, d.name. Dependency, so that's going to be name. And package is going to be d.package. Uh, what is it complaining about here? Expect a struct B tree map. Right, that's because this is an option. Unwrap or default. Ah, right. So this here is where we need to do the same chaining that we did over in publish uh, because dev dependencies are different from build dependencies or different from regular dependencies. Um, so we could have a helper for this instead, which says uh, ba -ba 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 -ba, over here that impl this dependencies uh, 
this is where it would be really nice to have partial bor borrows because so we can even have you can either have this take a reference to self in which case it can't actually take out the elements it could consume self but then you can't consume anything else from self what we really want to do is say this is only going to consume the fields dependencies build dependencies and um, dev dependencies but we can't we don't actually have a mechanism for doing so but what we can do is take dependencies and say that that is gonna give you a uh, impl iterator. Item is gonna be I guess cow tick a stir, which is the name of the package. Uh, a dependency, which is a tick A, and a dependency kind. That's what the iterator of this is gonna give you. Um, and it's gonna return this. Cells.dependencies.take, unwrapper default, self.devdependencies.take, that unwrapper default, self to build dependencies dot take dot unwrapper default. Uh, and this is going to be super publish dependency kind. And name in Tomal D kind. So we're gonna map that to like so. So now we have a thing that when you call this, it's gonna sort of steal all the dependencies and give us back this, this one chain dependency list instead, um, which now we should be able to make use of in publish. This should be able to do m dot uh, take dependencies and stick all those into here. And I guess I need to make this pub crate. This is now requirements. And then we collect that. Great. So now we can reuse that same method over in index, which is it is going to say let dependencies is v dot take dependencies dot map. Like so, uh, and I guess we can do arc from that as well if we really wanted to. And then this is just gonna be dependencies. And then we avoid duplicating all that stuff. This is now gonna be name, d, and kind. Kind, this is version. Uh, I guess optional is called something else over here because of course it is. Uh, so in dot create, what is it? Optional dependency called? No, it's called optional. Ah, but here it is an option bool, and here it is a actual bool. So in the index, the optional field isn't optional. Uh, which means unwrap or false. Things are not optional by default. Um, and this is unwrap or true because default features are on by default. Here, this is another place where we, we have some logic in publish for remapping the registry. 
Ah, so this is where <laughs> we're gonna need the. This is this is the really weird part, which is this conversion needs to know which registry are you generating this index entry on behalf of, in order to figure out what to put in the registry field. Uh, so vr registry, which is a stir. Uh, so it's actually a little tempting here to run this logic via the conversion of publish. The reason I'm not doing that is because there's some information that is only in the manifest that isn't in the publish info, namely uh, the public private thing. But maybe it's just not worth doing this conversion this way. Because we're we're duplicating a bunch of business logic here, like the the defaults for for optional and default features. This is kind of clunky. Although at the same time, it's it is very nice to be able to do it this way. I guess you know well, the thing. Actually, you know what we do here. I know what we do here. We do this. We say. Um, in registry is super publish create version uh, new v and checks uh, v and via registry, and then we s return self from publish in registry. Aha! And we can even do and here's the 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 tricky part which is the uh, entry is this. And then we actually get to carry over, um, over info that's not present in publish representation, which is then entry dot, oh, this is also gonna be annoying because really what we wanna say here is like, for every dependency, we want to go through and say whether or not it is public, depending on whether it was public in the original manifest, which is going to be something like uh, depths is entry dot arc get mute this expect. We haven't shared uh, the entry yet. So that is a, this is now a mutable reference to the list of dependencies. And then now we should be able to walk the list of dependencies, uh, which is probably going to be best done here. And then we're going to match on the kind. Uh, is always set by create version new, which I believe to be true, right? In uh, we always set the kind here. The kind comes from the kind here. Actually, why is this even an option? This isn't an option. Ah, uh, but in the index, it's an option. Uh, but we always set kind here to be sum. Okay, so that means it's always sum here. Uh, so this is either going to be in uh, v dot, oh, balls, but it's that's consumed. So what I was going to do was this. Um, right, and then we could walk 
We could do org depth list, uh, and these are all, I think, as ref. It's like if let some org depth list is org depth list. And here we could actually use let else. So we can do let uh, some else continue. It's my first use of uh, let else. I expected comma. Interesting. But, okay, so I need to do, I guess, oh, that's funky. So I need to do like, I guess this is a shortcoming of the syntax. So I do org depth list else continue. Uh, so that gives me the or depth list because if it's not in here, that means, or at the same time, doesn't it have to be the case that any dependencies that we have here must be in the original? So I, I think that's true. Expect. Um, Yeah, it shouldn't be possible for that to not be the case. Um, like if we have a dependency listed in the index entry we got, we, we generated, then that must be because the input had a an entry for that dependency listing in the first place. So looking up that dependency entry should never fail. Uh, and then we can do org depth list of uh, depth dot name. Dot public depth dot public so here's what I want it to do provide the argument uh, right check some now the reason this doesn't work and the reason why I think the borrow checker is about to yell at me right The reason why the borrow checker is going to yell at me, there we go, um, is because here we're trying to borrow into V, but we gave away ownership of V over here, uh, and that consumed the dependency list, among other things. So we don't get to do that. I also haven't defined into owned for this, but that shouldn't be necessary. So we don't get to do this. Uh, we would have to like walk to capture all of these ahead of time, or we would have to re-implement the, the transition logic explicitly, which I don't think we want to do. So we're just going to not deal with it for now. Uh, this is going to be tick A. This is going to be tick A. And in published line 61, K 
cannot borrow M as mutable. That's fine. Whew. Okay. So now we have the whole pipeline working, at least in theory. So we should be able now to do something like take a, ah, oh, what I want to do, right, is write tests for this using cargo as a library to generate these and using these other crates as well. But if I take a dev dependency on them, they can't depend on me. I forget whether cargo allows this. Can you take a dev dependency on something that takes a normal dependency on you? It's not technically a cycle. I forget whether cargo allows this. Uh... Path dependencies, multiple locations, target dependencies, development. Dependencies are not propagated to other packages which depend on this package. So this line makes me think that it's okay for me to take a dev dependency on cargo. Even if cargo ends up taking a dependency on me. Now, it doesn't explicitly say that cycles are allowed. But like if I do 68, the real question is if I do this, can cargo now depend on me? Oh yeah, I guess I could um, cargo new lib. Ah. Cargo index transit. Transit. No, no. This is when you don't use the sparse registries. I'm so excited for sparse registries by default. <laughs> or just to have it on stable, I'm so excited. I don't know if I can use cargo add because cargo add might not realize that it's not a cyclical dependency. I'm not sure. But this worked. All targets. I guess I should just override this to be beta too, really. I mean, the resolver didn't complain. That seems like it just works. Sweet. Because that, that means that I should be able to do round trip. So I, I should be able to run um, uh, 
I guess actually I could have done this entirely without um, without taking a library dependency on cargo technically, right? Because I could have just run like, you know, the equivalent of cargo new, like to actually do this by command. But uh, setting up the testing harness for this is going to be kind of annoying. But I guess realistically it would be something like... Uh, creator, yeah, I want like temporary directories and stuff here, but I also want uh, creates IO equals whatever version creates IO is at. 0.35, and I want creates index, which is at 0.19, and mm -mm. I guess the way to go about this is to take a dependency on something like tempter. I can never remember what it, whether it's tempter or temp file. Looks like it's tempter. No, temp file. Yes. Okay, great. Temp file. Sweet. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to take a dev dependency on temp file equals three dot three dot zero. Um, and I want tempter temp file tempter unwrap. Um, and then inside of there, I want to run cargo ops new. Hate having to construct cargo configs. Uh, maybe it should be explicitly documented that you can do those cycles. Hey, send a PR to the cargo team. I'm sure, they'll be happy to have PRs that add docs. Um, yeah, so the, I guess the way I would do this through new is so. Constructing a cargo config. Uh, so if you use the cargo config crate, you'll find that you end up using the cargo config type a lot. It is the configuration for cargo, and it is effectively the result of all of your cargo, all of the cargo configuration files that apply when cargo is used in a particular directory. So you can do just new, um, and when you do new, it is cargo new as of this particular directory. So you pass it something. Uh, so there's there's default, and when you construct it with default, what you get back is the current using the current directory. Uh, let cargo do its thing. What I want to do is I want to pass in a path instead. So I'm going to use new instead of default, and then you have to pass a shell, which I think is just default. Um, and you have to pass uh, the current working directory, which is going to be T, and the home directory, which is going to be home, but I could just use T here too, I suppose. Uh, in fact, I'm going to do t.path.join create. 
dot path dot join. In fact, I'm just going to do t dot path and t dot path dot join cargo home. Uh, and you might think that once you've done this. And now you have a cargo config, but you have not. You also need to configure the cargo config. Wait, why is this not? Uh, I guess it's not an unwrap. Uh, and it's not T, it's D. Uh, and this is complaining because it expected a path buff. And this needs to be into path buff into ah to path buff i apologize now configure takes a bajillion arguments uh, verbose false quiet false color none frozen false lock so configure is basically the command line arguments to cargo so new is where are you and configure are the arguments to cargo as you have deemed them. Uh, offline false, targeter has not been overridden. Uh, there are no unstable flags uh, and there is no CLI config. Unwrap. And it's complaining about my use of none because it wants a reference to an option and it is complaining about my verbosity of false because verbosity is a U32. Okay. So now we basically have a, a, an environment in which to run cargo. And so now we can run the equivalent of cargo new, which is version control, none, kind, N new project kind lib whoa it's very confused what what does it want here use cargo ops N what does, car Does Cargo not expose this? But it's a field in one of its options. The The Cargo library interface is um, not always the easiest to work with. Well, how about that? New project kind isn't a public type. So I can't construct one of these. It's in the Cargo... Use cargo ops car. Ah, it's not public because the cargo ops uh, the module for cargo new isn't pub. So the type is pub, the new project kind type is pub see right here, but the module it's in is not pub. So this is one of those unreachable pubs, which means that we're now at the, uh, the awkward point where I can't call cargo new. So if someone wants to fire up a quick PR to the cargo project to make the cargo new module pub or re-export this type, uh, somewhere around here, probably here. Just re-export uh, new project kind as part of the re other re-exports from Cargo New. It's a great one-line PR to Cargo. Go do it right now. Watch, you got four PRs in like a second. Um, well, that's awkward. Um, can I default default? No, this is the, the secret way to get around it. When you run into situations like this, sometimes that inner type 
that's not exposed implements default. And when it does, you can just default default. Um, but I can't do that either. Uh, can I do this? No, it doesn't let me do that either. Um, well then. That makes me very sad because I don't want to now run cargo from the command line. I guess what I'll do is just... Uh, Wait, don't I have a checkout of cargo somewhere? Dev others cargo. Pull. Cargo Tommel. Let's do a patch. Crates IO. Cargo equals path equals. Uh, home, John, dev, others, cargo, like so. And then we change, what file was this? Source cargo ops, mod, and we also expose here new version kind. No, new. new project kind. And now if I do this, I should be able to do new project kind lib. Ah, uh, no, no. Mm, no. Patch 070, that's because cargo is a couple of versions ahead. That's fine. Uh, I suppose I could change this to be stash. Uh, zero dot sixty eight dot zero. Dash pop, and now this can stay the way it was. Cargo check, uh, all targets. Uh, that seems like that missing export is a pretty, pretty big oversight. If I didn't trust you, I think there's a different approved approach to accomplishing this. How do other projects do this? <laughs> so, okay, um, there are a couple of parts to this. Cargo as a library is not planned. It is the things that happen to be asked for by people over time, mostly. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff that like the, the, the cargo library API is not really well documented. It's often awkward to work with. Um, and this is stuff that like, if you want to try to make it better, please do it. It would be fantastic, but it requires a lot of work and cargo does change a lot internally over time. And so keeping that library API stable is, is tricky and figuring out exactly what to expose. Um, it's not usually like an approved way to do things because the cargo library API is just generally discouraged from use in the first place. Uh, I think in the, the general sense from the cargo team is prefer to use the command line tools if you can, because those are stable. Don't rely on the library API. Uh, I don't want to do that here, but but that's the intention. Um, the reason why this particular thing is wasn't caught is because the lint to detect unreachable public items isn't um, documented anywhere. Or uh, I've been streaming for too long. It's not that it's not documented anywhere. It's not on by default. It is allow by default. Um, oh, Wei Hang, thanks. <laughs> Wei Hang is uh, gonna fix the problem. One of the cargo maintainers who's in chat and is just gonna fix it while we're at it, which is fantastic. Um, 
the unreachable pub lint is not worn by default at the moment. And the reason is because it's kind of incomplete. Sometimes it can be really hard to tell whether something is unreachable by design or not. Um, so whether you should lint or not, whether it's actually unreachable is complicated to compute. And so the lint is just too, it has too many buggy cases to have it actually worn by default. So it's allowed by default, which it has been for a long time, which means that things like this slip through. Um, okay. So now we should be able to do this and Use cargo ops new project kind. Thank you. Uh, and it also wants config, which is easy enough. We have one of those. This is why you named it defenestration. Uh, well, defenestration is the name of my computer, which I often do want to throw out a window. Auto detect kind. I don't know what auto detect kind is for. False? Auto detect kind. Oh, I see. Uh, false. Lib is the kind I want. Um, path. Absolute path to the directory for the new package. Uh, so the question is, does that include the name or does it not? I feel like path is probably s expected to be the current directory. Uh, if I go back to, nope. Source, bin cargo, commands, new. So path is the argument that you pass to new. And that's interesting. So start new options. See, I think they're lying. Uh, in somewhere here, it says absolute path to the directory for the new package. And I do not think that's true because I think path, and based on this, path is the argument you pass to cargo new. And you can run cargo new foo. It does not have to be an absolute path. So I think path here is going to be d dot path dot join, uh, you know, round trip, the name of the crate, and name is going to be none, as in we're allowing that to be inferred from the path. Addition. We're not passing in. We want whatever the recent one is. Registry, none. We don't want a custom one. Uh, dot unwrap. Uh, package is going to be there. Okay. So now I should be able to run cargo ops 
uh, package. In fact, package one. Uh, so now I want a workspace, which is going to be cargo or mm, core workspace. Aha, find workspace root. No, not find workspace root. Workspace new. The manifest path is going to be package.join cargo.toml. And we're going to pass in the config and we're going to unwrap. And that's going to give us a workspace. The only reason I know these by hand is because I've done a lot of using the cargo library API. Um, nice. We have at least two people writing the PR. Uh, okay, so we have a workspace now. It's complaining about this. That's fine. So once we have a workspace, then we should now be able to pass that workspace uh, and workspace.current. which is just going to be the main package because there's not really a workspace and package opts. Dot unwrap. So that's going to be the tarball. And I happen to know it's going to need a second unwrap. The reason for this is because what package one returns is an option file lock. And the option here is because if you run package with dash dash list, it'll list the things that would package, but it doesn't generate a tarball. Hence the return here is an option. Uh, so you'll see the list option, which we're gonna set to false. Config and why that has to be passed in separately here for package one, rather than being passed as an argument to package is a little unclear, but it does. Uh, check metadata, is we're going to set to false. Allow dirty, we're going to set to true. Verify, we're going to set to false so it doesn't build. Jobs, we're going to use the default. Keep going, we're going to set to false. So keep going is if the build fails, then keep trying to build to give me more failures. Uh, to package is going to be packages default, which is... Um, this is basically if you were, were to pass the dash P flag and I just want to not pass the dash P flag, which is default, uh, targets is going to be, uh, vec new cause I don't have any particular targets and CLI features is just going to be default, which I thought you could do, but maybe you can't new all. Uh, I don't want to compile it with all features. Okay, so now we have a tarball. And now we need to grab out the um, manifest from the tarball. Uh, for verify, yeah. So verify means by default it's on. And what verify means is before you run package, try to build the current package to make sure that it can actually be built uh, so that you're not publishing something that other people can't build. And the, the build here is a little special. It runs with, with your default configuration rather than you know any custom configuration you might have in your home directory. It doesn't respect patches. So it basically tries to do a build as if someone else were doing the build. Um, so it's verify here is should you also do the verify step? Um, okay, so now we need to extract the cargo toml from the packaged thing, uh, which we can do by uh, extracting the tarball, which we already saw an example of that over in crates.io, uh, which was over here somewhere. So 
Somewhere over the rainbow. Um, Cargo Tom, what were you at? So they take a dependency on... Whoa, that's a lot of stuff. Um, Flate 2. So these are things to actually extract a... Um, one of these uh, dot .crate files. We're also gonna need tar. Tar. Yar. And then we can probably just copy paste their code here, which is decoder. Uh, read of tarball dot path. Oh, actually, I think I can just do tarball dot file. No, maybe. And and I should be able to do this. And then I should be able to do this. So I'm grabbing out the each entry from the archive. And if the and if entry dot path dot ends with cargo dot then I want to do the test. I'll get back to do the test in a second. Uh, why doesn't it give me GC decoder? Please give me GC decoder. Thank you. Path is entry dot unwrap. Right, so how do they grab the bytes out of this, which is what I really want now? Um Aha. So then we're going to do let mute manifest. Um, entry dot read to string. Unwrap. I.O. read. So now, the interesting part comes, which is we want to do, now we have a manifest. So we should now be able to do um, use cargo index transit star pass sit. So we should now be able to do let sit uh, dot create normalized manifest is equal to, oh, here we're going to need uh, chomel from string of manifest dot unwrap. Expected unit struct, right, like so. Implementation of deserialize is not general enough. Scary. Oh, I think actually this is just manifest.parse.unwrap. But fine, we'll do um, 
Nope. Oh, actually, I do want Tommel edit. So why did I even bring Tommel in? Not sure. I think I only need that as a dev dependency. And then I think I also need it with derive with like 30. Yeah. Features equals 30 like so. And now we should be able to do uh, D from stir. Hmm. Why is it complaining? Must implement deserialize for any lifetime, but it actually implements for that lifetime. Ooh. So this sounds like we missed a borrow somewhere. It's either we missed a borrow or um, Serde isn't correctly propagating the borrows into these subtypes. Um, let's go look at the Serde docs to see if I messed this up. Field attributes, Serde borrow. No, that should be fine. So did I miss a borrow in dependency? I don't think I missed a borrow in dependency either. Did I miss a borrow in package? I did. Keywords needs to borrow. Would have been so good if that just fixed it. Uh, borrow, borrow, borrow. It could also be it's not a missing borrow, but Usually it is, but now I can't spot one. Um, alternatively, it might be something about our little weird string or bool thing. So first and foremost, this should be this. Really? Not that it really matters, but. Oh. Right, that was on readme. So this needs to be dot into owned. So I need a impl string or bool. So this just maps to the same bool, and this maps to uh, into owned cow owned of into owned. Oh, this should be string. Yeah, it's entirely just a convention to have these kinds of methods. There's no, there's no built-in. Um, uh, 
string or bool into old. Now that doesn't fix the problem though. I wish it did. Uh, must implement D zeros for it. So I wonder why. Like, if I do this, will it let me do? Will it let me be happy? Hmm. I have, I have angered the borrow gods. Oh, it might be version, tr it might be the version trim white space thing. Yeah, this should implement uh, visits. Um, Docs thirty. Show me the visitor trait for deserialize. There is visit borrowed string. And I want that. Actually, that shouldn't matter because this one is doing an owned parsing anyway. Implementation deserialize is not general enough. All right, let's see if, if the expansion here helps us. So for normalized manifest. Why is there even a tick A here? That's what I want to know. Hmm. This is very strange because as far as I can tell, um, there's nothing here that would make this be unable to borrow its input. Like,
I just want to see whether this uh, makes it happy. It shouldn't. Okay. So that didn't do it. So it's, I don't think it's the, um, the custom deserialize here. I think what I want to see is whether this, there's no, there's, there shouldn't be any reason why the, the additional nesting here makes a difference. Um, wait a second. I think I remember now why. I think there's a special interaction between cow and the borrow annotations that makes it not work when it's inside an option. I mean, this should be easy enough to test out, right? So, so if we did, um, drive, view, sort of derive, deserialize, use Tomal edit and then we do something like drive deserialize struct foo sort of borrow I'll take a stir, uh, and then I do, you know, let x equals time will edit d Implementation of deserialize is not general enough. That doesn't seem right. Oh, fun. This is just a limitation of Tommel or of the Tommel deserializer. Ugh. See, that's what I thought, that this is actually, I think, <clears throat> Tommel edit D fromster. It requires the T implements deserialize owned, not just deserialize. Why does it require that? Deserialize owned. Closed. Close of 490. Okay, so that's interesting. So Tomal Edit doesn't support this and doesn't plan to. Hmm. So that's not what I wanted. Uh, 
But in theory, we should be able to do this. Oop. Uh, oop. Why doesn't it... So the normalized manifest, we don't have deserialized owned for. That's interesting. The next question now is, why doesn't it implement deserialized owned also? Because it should be the case that our, um, our types here, like why wouldn't this also implement deserialized owned for us? Because I think if I remember correctly, for the surde uh, de deserialized owned, implement deserialized owned for T, where T implements deserialized DE for any DE, which should already be the case. Like, just as a sanity check, that the wrong way around. D D serialize owned. Okay, so normalized manifest doesn't implement deserialized owned. So that implies that it doesn't meet the bound that do, 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 it doesn't implement deserialize for any uh, or for all rather lifetimes. Which is weird because it really should. That makes me sad. Um, okay, so we, so we have two options here. Um, or we have a couple of options here. One is use an older version of Toml that does support um, borrowing deserialization. Another option is for the normalized manifest to give up on using borrowed strings or borrowed anythings. Uh, and a third option is to make normalized manifest generic over its string types. And the reason why we might want generic over the string types is because cargo, if you remember in ooh, over here somewhere, Tomo manifest. So for Tomo manifest, actually for Tomo manifest, yeah, so for Tomo manifest, it does use intern strings. Uh, interestingly enough, It uses it for features uh, 
and for package names and only those. Um, which means that, let's see actually whether workspace dependency, TOML dependency, detail TOML dependency, That one does not, huh? Tomal manifest. So it's the name inside of a package, but not the names of its dependencies. And the names of features And the and not features of dependencies or names of dependencies. Weird. Uh, so I mean, mm, that's frustrating. Um, I guess what we'll do then is name and features and say this is, so package is gonna have name and fe uh, features. Dependencies are just gonna be strings because that's all we get. Uh, alternatively, we could refuse to borrow, but I'm just gonna, I guess I'll just make them strings. Uh, an intern string is a, a technique or a, a, a type that is in cargo, which is um, if you create an intern string, it first does a lookup into a, a hash map of whether it has seen that string before and gives you a pointer to the previously allocated string if it was previously allocated. Uh, feature, feature, and I guess not feature on package. Uh, and these don't get interned, which seems weird. I'm just gonna go ahead and disagree with that and claim that those should also be interned if the name is interned. Um, and for dependency, that's now gonna take Actually, dependencies don't have, I'm still gonna claim that these are gonna take intern strings. Cows all the way down, yeah, that's right. Uh, so dependencies are gonna inherit feature. Uh, so there are no more borrows. Uh, there's no more need for into owned because there's no um, because there's no borrowing in the first place. Uh, this now gives you name and feature. Um, this is now a string. No borrow, no borrow. No borrow. This is a string. No borrow. This is a string. Note, this doesn't use borrowing deserialization because Tomal edit doesn't support it. Uh, package is generic over name, which is not borrow. It's a string. This is a string. It's 
Nope. And all of these are strings. And no more into owned here. And string or bool is no longer generic here. It's just gonna be a string of string. No more into owned here. No more cows over there. And no more into owned here. And that means publish now needs to be generic here over name and feature. Where name implements into cow tick a stir and feature implements into cow stir. That's the main thing that matters. Um, and it's probably going to complain at me somewhere here. Right, index is going to have the same problem where it's going to require name and feature. Um, <laughs> and th this one's kind of funny because here we could actually take if if we didn't go via the conversion to crate version, we could reuse the name and feature up here. Mm, but we're not going to do that because we don't want to implement the whole contents of that. Now there's more of a reason to. Um, Like so, where's it gonna yell at me now? It's gonna yell at me add 132. That's because all of these have now changed. Because none of these are the same anymore. So this now needs to be enter into iter.map.collect where it's no, it's now Key and value needs to be k dot into, and this needs to be. I guess this is actually a vector. So this is v's dot into iter dot map dot clone. No collect into into, and we're gonna have to do the same for this conversion. Uh, although this one is just into into. Description is map into into. Documentation, homepage, license, license file, repository and links. Uh, keywords. It's going to be this and categories is going to be this. So all of them get converted using into. This is into. And this has to be converted the same way the other one does, which is this way. All right, we're getting pretty close here now. Hopefully, um, uh, name is into, this is into. Whoa. Actually, th 
those probably don't need to be converted here. They need to be converted up here because here we swap them sometimes, but not others. Uh, so this has to be into, and this has to be into. P, P is string. Okay. Uh, so that's going to be something like cow owned now. Um, there we go. Oh boy. Okay, dot crate 29. What do we got here? Right, we're going to require here that feature is ORD. Because otherwise we can't iterate over the B tree map. Which then means we're going to have to change that in publish where feature is ORD and an index where feature is ORD. Okay, 35. But it returns string. What do you mean it returns string? All right, it returns string. Uh, great. So now we're back to via cargo. And now this should be able to do this. Uh, and we should be able to say string and string. Beautiful. Okay. Great stuff. Okay. We now have this line compiling. Uh, and now, at least in theory, we should be able to say the publish uh, crate version. Crate version is just generic over A, so we should be able to assign any here. Should be set publish crate version new, pass in the M and the registry that it's for, which we're going to go ahead and say is not that one, github.com, which I think we have somewhere here, this URL. And then the index entry. And let's say this is string, sember version, sember version rec, string, 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 uh, is index entry new. And, you know, we'll just do u0, 32. We don't care about the hash here. Ah from publish Am I lying? From publish ah p great expected entry string 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 got cow uh, ah. Right, this already dictates all the values. And so now it should be the case that we should be able to check that at every step of the way here, and certainly at the end, we should be able to check that i, which is the index entry here, is equal to, and what did we call the thing? We called the thing round trip. i dot name and i dot version 
should be 0.1.0, because that's what cargo new generates, uh, which means it should be semver version new 0.1.0. All right, cargo test. And I guess technically what we also want to do is that each step of the way here, say, um, here, we should be able to do JSON is 30 JSON. Did I already stick in a JSON converter here? No. Uh, 30 JSON two string of P. And I should be able to here say uh, crates IO new crate is 30 JSON fromster of JSON. Right? That that should be the case that whatever we generate actually is is parsable by crates IO. Um, and it should also be the case that if we go back to JSON from P2. Uh, and then we do P3 is one of these. Um, it should be the case that that's a, a reasonable round trip where uh, P and P3 are equal. And this certainly should implement debug. And that means dependency doesn't implement debug, which we really want it to do. Equals cannot be applied. Um, seems pretty reasonable to have this implement eek and partial eek. Same for dependency. There's nothing particularly weird in here. It's all just strings. Um, so we expect that round trip to work. Uh, we also expect for the index for, uh, let's see, is the cargo registry thing public? Registry data. Mm, it doesn't look like it. Ah, registry package. Yeah, but it doesn't look like it can do anything with a registry package. But I should be able to parse one. So if I do this, cargo, where was it? Sources, registry. I can't spell registry package is nope this bit that should certainly work and similarly uh, the same thing should be the case for it doesn't implement serialize right yeah uh, creates index uh, version I2, and then I should be able to go back to JSON from I2, get I3, which is gonna be a index entry. It's gonna be that from string, and then I should be able to assert equals I to I3. And now, I think it should be able to infer all of those because I'm saying equals. And at the end, I should get round trip. Whew. Okay, so now we have the whole string of tests that in theory should pass, and in practice, of course, does not. Not yet implemented as depends on file contents in dot crate. Right, so this is the readme stuff, which we still haven't dealt with. Um, And I don't, I honestly don't know what we do here. Like, I, I think what I want to do is for now, just say this is none, none, and it's just unimplemented. 
I'm gonna go ahead and say to do. Okay, so something else fails. Missing field keywords at line 73. So crates.io requires that keywords is present, which we don't currently do. So in our publish keywords, we currently skip it if the vector is empty, which we're apparently not allowed to do. I'm guessing the same applies to categories. Also worth keeping in mind, you know, this is this is a package with no dependencies and nothing. So th there's going to be other ah oh, badges. It was going to come back to bite us. Uh, Um, I want, like, I want this, I guess. Because I don't actually want to do badges. <laughs> uh, badges, none. All right, what else we got? Invalid type null, expected a map. Of course you do be true map new. And here we're gonna also gonna say sturdy default. So, cause it can't be an option. Why use an option over a simple empty hash map? Yeah, or in this case, an empty B tree map. Um, the, what I what I arguably could do here is like a vector of nothings um, has the same structure. Well, that that worked. We did get a, a round trip. The readme thing is is definitely frustrating because. Right, because without this, Cargo wouldn't be able to use what we built. Um, I mean, I guess we could just say you have to pass in the readme. Right, and say that's going to be... Uh, it's readme and readme contents. And readme and readme contents are, you know, about cows. It's an option cow to a stir. That's certainly one way to <laughs> get around it, right? Um, so now the via stuff is gonna have to change a little bit because it's going to require that we pass this in, but we can do none, none here. Uh, publish is going to be sad. Why? Because index 95 doesn't know what to do with it. And this is frustrating because when we come from publish, we don't care about the readme for the index, but that just means that we can pass in none, none here. None, none. Sounds like a 
bit of a song. Whew. Okay. So now we have a full round trip and we've demonstrated that it is compatible with the uh, crates.io crate and the ba -ba 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 -ba, crates index crate. We haven't tested this for anything beyond a trivial archive. Like for example, you know, or a trivial crate rather, once you add dependencies and stuff, things get obviously a lot more complicated. So we would want tests here that test, you know, does the round trip work even if you add dependencies? Uh, it would be a good thing to test. Um, but at least this is a pretty good start. The, the thing that would also be nice to test here is the integration with crates.io, but because their types aren't public in a way where we can test them here, um, it's not trivial for us to do so. But the hope of course is that this is possible to slot in for them. And uh, what's also interesting here, I think, is you know, we could turn this into a test harness pretty easily by making this, instead of being this, this being a test, this could be a, a function that takes two, cl two closures, one to run uh, here, so right after new, but before opening the workspace, and one to run... Uh, here, which is additional checks to run after you've checked that the round trips all worked. Uh, and that way we could write a bunch of, uh, a bunch of tests around that. And in fact, let's just do that refactoring right now um, to say, simplest, which is gonna be round trip of nothing nothing so this is going to be generic over a um, setup uh, and I guess that'll be given a path something like a path and a uh, check it's gonna be impl fn ones um, I don't even know what it'll be given. I guess we can actually give it all of the types, right? So we can give it uh, a dot crate uh, normalized manifest string string uh, we can give a publish crate version and we can give a index entry string some reversion some reversion rec string 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 uh, although actually these are going to be not string but cow stir cow stir cow stir And yes, we're gonna want cow because now I should be able here to run uh, clone. Really? That's certainly something we'll want. Did I not add derived clone to these? Cause they're gonna have to be clone. This is gonna have to be clone. Uh, and same for dot crate. It's gonna have to be clone. And the dependencies already clone. Okay. Aha, no more string or bool. So now this can just ignore the path. And down here, we're gonna do something like um, check M P I. To 
Did that work? Dot crate is complaining about this. That's fine. 101. I was lied to. Cannot do type path. That's easy enough. And this takes three arguments. Oh, and I don't call setup, which I need to call here. Right. So now it should be possible to do, you know, I don't know, something like here where path, you know, depth. One depth. Add a dependency to p slash cargo.toml. And then here to do check that i contains index index entry contains appropriate dependency specifier but i don't think i'm going to actually write more tests for this today because i need to eat um, but that seems pretty promising okay uh, what I'll do is I will do something like, uh, can remove expanded. I'll uh, git ignore my dot cargo. And I will git add dot. S all right. And my patch will hopefully not be necessary for anyone else. Actually, do do do. Here's what I'll do. Uh, add dash p. Commit. First thing that maybe works? Question mark. And I'll I'll push that to a Git repo and and publish it and stuff. But hey, we built a thing. There's obviously a bunch more work to do, right? Like. We would want to try to make changes to cargo to make use of this, make changes to crates IO to make use of this, make changes to the crates IO package to make use of this, make changes to the crates index package to make use of this. There's a bunch more documentation, a bunch more testing that's needed, but at least now we have the, the, the basic types and the conversions between them all in one crate. Uh, and then hopefully, you know, that, that might actually turn out to be useful and feel free to like dig into this and try to add more tests and, and, uh, you know, play around with it. Whether it actually gets picked up, I'm not sure. But even if it doesn't, you know, this is a decent introduction to how that entire pipeline works and all the weird little transformations that happen along the way. <sighs> now I need water and food. But uh, thank you all for, for joining. Uh, hopefully this was at least somewhat interesting to, to participate in. And I'm hoping this will this will give you, you know, a little bit of a an exciting feel for going to dig a little bit into cargo, into some of these crates, maybe into this one. Uh, and I think that's where we're going to end it off. Are there any questions at the end? It's been a very long journey, so I'm, I wouldn't blame you if you're all tired and don't want to ask questions. But if there are any, fire away. Uh, add fuzzing to this. You know, fuzzing for this is a great idea. One of the things that's, that's problematic with the current state of affairs is that because these connections aren't built in a way where they're sort of standalone. It's very hard to test them. It's hard to test interoperability. It's hard to fuzz them because they're all like super ingrained into cargo, for example. So this crate should be possible to, to you know, do fuzz testing on, prop testing on, um, just general round trip testing on. So, so absolutely, please add that. That, that would be amazing.
All right, doesn't look like any great questions, or ra let me rephrase, it doesn't look like there are a great number of big questions or any big questions. All of your questions are great. Uh, so I'm gonna end it all there. Thank you for joining. Uh, I don't know whether there'll be a part two of this, but maybe, we'll see. It depends whether this uh, ends up going somewhere. All right, bye folks.